Hey, it's John Carlos, and I am here with my dear friend, BJ. Uh, say something to everybody. Something to everybody. There I'm we BJ. go. <laughs> so, um, uh, BJ and I have been buddies for a long time, and one of the things that we like to do is sit around and talk movies, which is really hard to do when I'm stuck at home, you're stuck at home. At least we can, it's harder to talk with each other about it. So um, it's nice for me to get together on Zoom and kill some time while I'm stuck at home. This isn't just, it's, it's fun for me. It's, it's therapeutic for me. So uh, Ditto. Anyway, thank, you, thank you for joining me tonight. Ditto. Thank you for having me. One, and one thing, when we work together, mm -hmm. that we love to discuss is we love to discuss James Bond movies we and James sure Bond actors did, and I, I can recall specifically one thing you and I didn't talk about. Literally, uh, not a segue, but we didn't talk about Connery as much as we complained about aspects of like you know Brosnan or or more and 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 or more. and then also we because that's one of the things is that uh, Eve. I don't even remember how we became friends. I just know it was kind of immediate. And, and early on in our friendship, uh, at, when we worked together, uh, you had a locker that opened up and you had magnets and you had two magnets. I believe it was two magnets and it was Timothy Dalton magnets and I'm a massive Timothy Dalton fan mm -hmm. and especially of uh, Living Daylights and License to Kill. Him, his, his portrayal as James, as James Bond, I mean, I love him in The Rocketeer and The Line in Winter uh, and, and all those things, but I, I love, love, love his Bond movies, and as uh, we get older, uh, it, it's it's harder to find Bond fans that know anybody but Daniel Craig. Yeah, and I, and I grew up in the era where uh, everyone my age says Pierce Brosnan is my Bond. And we go, mm, okay. Yeah, 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 the same, and, same. And I'm friends with a lot of people who are older than me and who Roger Moore is their Bond. Yeah, and, yeah, and I'm the, shocked by that. I'm, sh I'm, I'm surprised by all of that, actually. The, and the primary reason whenever I ask someone is, uh, oh, right, why Roger Moore? Number one answer, the only answer, because that's who I grew up with when I was a kid. Right. I don't like, know anybody, mm. I have never met anybody that ever says, because Roger Moore is the best looking, Roger Moore is the most like the book, Roger Moore is the the best action friendly. Roger Moore is the most believable. None of those ever have, Roger, Roger Moore is the best actor. I have never heard any of those. I've just heard, like you said, I grew up with Roger Moore as James Bond, therefore he's James Bond. Yeah, I, I, and I'll admit that uh, when I started getting into Bond, it was during the Brosnan years, so I had an affinity for him as my Bond, but you know, my vocabulary grew as I watched all the movies and I got over that and uh so the Roger Moore people don't get over that well it's funny um, it's funny because like yeah because uh my era I because you know in, in high school because I'm a little bit older than you not a whole lot but I, I'm a little bit older than you yeah so when I yeah. when I when I was growing up uh Roger Moore was James Bond and um as a kid I I saw James Bond very very early on I my parents showed me movies I had no business watching um, at a very early age, and I saw a lot of the Bond movies as a kid. I grew up on Bond. Um, shockingly, I didn't see Honor Majesty's Secret Service until much, much, much later, but um, the Connery and Roger Moore Bonds I grew up on, and I was a fully functioning like Bond fan when Timothy Dalton became Bond, when uh, Brosnan became Bond, and when uh, obviously when Daniel Craig became Bond, because those are my twenties. But because yeah, um, Octopussy is like eighty three, so if you're growing up with like that on as a new release on VHS, by the right. time and, you're and, like and, four and or five or six, wait, wait, Octopussy, and then what's after Octopussy? Is that um, is that that's Moonraker, right? Thought, Moonraker's after Octopussy, correct? I thought Moonraker was before Octopussy. Mm, that makes the sense. One, that's the one thing is, you know, I can list off chronologically Connery movies and Brosnan right. movies, but my brain doesn't want to give much space to the Roger Moore era. I yeah, can it's tell you, it started with Living Let Die and went into Man with Golden Gun, and then it starts to get kind of hazy, especially because he has so many. I think he has like seven. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because those get all, it, it's hard for me to know the, the order of the, uh, his his Bond movies they they seem to kind of be interchangeable, except for Live and Let Die because that was the only one that they 
you know, treated seriously, in my opinion, um, and for your eyes only. I was going to um, say, for your eyes only. But even for your eyes only, they wanted to recast already. So, uh, and also, did you know, I, I read today, I don't know if that, this is accurate, I have to look it up, but um, Roger Moore is older than Sean Connery. Is that uh, true? I think, I don't, that wouldn't surprise Roger? me. Let me look at probably his not age. by much. I do know. I do know that um, Roger Moore. Yes, then he is because I know that Roger Moore is older in Octopussy, which came out the same year as Never Say Never Again. Never Again. Yeah, 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 he's years, yeah, he's three years older than Connery. Yeah. Well, one thing that I was uh, on one of the many making ofs, uh, the making of Doctor No, that one of the producers, I think, was. Alexander, is it Salkind? Was he one of the Sal producers? Yeah. No. Salkind was one of the producers of what? No, no, no. Um, but there's Broccoli and there's the other guy. Broccoli. Is it, is it Broccoli Broc or Broccoli? I've always heard Broccoli and then documentaries. People, I've heard both. Uh, yeah. I'm a mad okay. Bond fan. But right. Alexander, Alexander, whatever is nuts. Because they looked at a few people. But anyway, Alexander said in an interview, in an old interview, where we were looking at Roger Moore, but he was busy with TV. Like, they were looking at Roger Moore for Dr. No. Yeah. I'm glad that didn't work out for several movies. Oh, yeah. There's, yeah, there's, a, there's a huge amount of uh, reasons I'm very, very happy that, that that didn't happen. Let me see. I'm going to, Diamonds Are Forever, Live and Let Die. Okay, let me keep scrolling. I'm looking at the order of the films. Spy Who Loved Me. Ugh. I still think Octopussy is last. Either that or... I think, I think, I think Octop yeah, Octopussy and then A View to a Kill. View to a Kill. Yeah. Octopussy, Never Say Never Again, A View to a Kill. Those are the You're absolutely right. Um, Which is crazy because Moonraker came I'm, I'm, I'm during the Star Wars era, but it just, it just hits, it hits me weird that after that, they went to Octopussy and then to View to a Kill, which kind of just seems anticlimactic because Moonraker was you know, so insane with what they were doing that they toned it down for Octopussy. Yeah, Octopussy is uh, considerably smaller budgeted compared to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, I wonder, it's funny because I was looking at the, um, I was looking at the, the financial reception of uh, Never Say Never Again, Octopussy, um, You Only Live Twice, Live and Let Die, because I was looking at, you know, the fandom's reaction financially to uh, all of the the casting changes after uh, you only lived twice, and I saw it was interesting because the the Connery movies kept going up and up and up and up and up and up and up in income. However, mm -hmm. there was sharp there was a sharp dip on you only lived twice. Then there was a sharper dip on Her Majesty's Secret Service, and then it was a little bit of a then there was a rebound on every, on um, Diamonds Are Forever. And then it dipped pretty massively again, cut in half on Live and Let Die. And then once they got to Octopussy and Never Say Never Again came out, Never Say Never Again cost half as much, if not less, than Octopussy, but made a, a, a huge uh, income. It did well. It did really well. Octopussy. So yeah, so if you look at, because Octopussy made $20 million more than never say never again but never say never again costs somewhat of like 30 to 50 million dollars less than mm -hmm. octopus so and the reviews for octopussy were terrible which you know we'll get to that that's appropriate moore, yeah and the roger moore era um i mean you put james bond as a clown you know you, you're gonna have to deal with stuff like that but um never say never again actually had really positive reviews in comparison to octopussy which obviously we'll get to talking about connery as bond but i think it's really interesting that the connery casting change up and and the other people that in you know the, the casting situation that ensued in the next three pictures is really interesting i'll tell you something else interesting completely unrelated to what we were just talking about but kicked off by the fact that they were looking at roger moore as one of the bonds uh, initially one of the other ones that really blew my mind that i think you'll get a kick out of did you know they were looking at richard johnson mm -hmm. who played dr markway in the haunting that's interesting, which is weird because in the book, his name is Dr. Montague. So the fact that they changed it. Um, uh, but I'm not against it. 
No, no, I wouldn't be against it either. He would much. He'd be closer to the, um, definitely closer to, the author of James Bond because he he, there's there as an illustration, that um, that was done of what the Bond character looks like, uh, in regard to how, you know. The creator, you know, decided what he looked like. And it definitely is more in line with that actor as opposed yeah. to Sean Connery. Or, you know, because Ian Fleming was not a fan of Sean Connery until much later on. Uh, until after he had left as Bond, where he yeah. was even positive. He, uh, the, the story is that he watched Dr. No in an early screening and walked out and somebody at a bar, you know, was talking to him. He told them that they made a movie off, based off a book, not knowing who he was, that he wrote. And he said it was just, it was dribble and awful and all and they and the guy who played bond played his character was dreadful and then you know it's sean connery is james bond so pretty funny yeah um one of the things that i've been meaning to do this year was just sit down and watch all the bond movies like over the course of like you know weekends or you know try to take like a week off you know burn some vacation pay or something and uh then all this happened <laughs> and i'm yeah, like well, okay. well here's one thing i can do with my time i can i can do that thing i wanted to do and um because i i i don't know if you ever recall having this conversation but we we'd, we'd ranked the bonds at work years ago and we both had joked about how like the question is who's your favorite bond mm -hmm. the question is who's your favorite bond behind connery because Connery's always going to be number one. So what's more interesting is who's your number two. Right, um, absolutely. I'm curious how I'll feel after watching all these because the one thing that really blew my mind watching these first, because I'm just going to a chronological order, but the first six Connery movies, and now, well, seven if you count Never Say Never Again. I don't want to, I'm, I'm not talking trash, but like maybe something about me is aged, but it, it, it's not quite the same. I agree. I was having that. So today I was in the shower and I was thinking about us having this conversation. Um, and I really, you know, and in this past, you know, in this past week, I reviewed the films and, you know, watched some commentaries on them. Uh, what people thought, reread the synopses and watched them. I watched Dr. No specifically and uh, uh, Goldfinger because, uh, yeah, and then I, you know, and then I, I watched, uh, uh, some of Diamonds are for like I was watching the the movies and going oh that's the movie okay I remember this I remember this because they they kind of blend together uh, as as further as you get away uh, and and sitting back and looking at them I realized that I was like wow so many of the, these are so similar the 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 Connery Bonds are so similar to each other with certain elements that I in elements. my they all blend together and I don't know I don't know if I can honestly say that that I would say the same thing you know, 10, 15 years later after we had that conversation where I said, well, who's your favorite Bond after Connery? Because Connery is James Bond. Therefore, who's the best actor to play Bond after him? I don't know if I can agree with that statement anymore. Yeah. I think I have a very different opinion. Yeah, and I can't help but wonder if part of it is my, you know, just getting older. But two, um, the last four with Daniel Craig treat the character like so seriously and the tones for right. most of them are so somber. And his character is very joyless. And that's not a bad thing. And even the Pierce Brosnan ones, even when the movies got silly, like his character is played a little more straight than any of the silliness yeah, from the 60s. His GoldenEye performance, my God. When we, oh, when we get great. to I, we have to talk. GoldenEye and um, for some reason, the world was not enough. But we'll, we'll get to that. But the character is played extremely dark. And I can't help but um, wonder if that's affecting yeah. my view now. Yeah, big time. Um, but when I was a teen, when I was in my 20s, I thought Connery was awesome. And he's still, to a certain degree, as just like, you know, the bravado of a movie star, he's awesome. Right. Right. But one of the things that really surprised me was how, um, dare I say, like, almost immature about the way he'll, like, walk into a room and, like, the, the, his superiors are doing this and he's making little sex jokes and, like, little flirty. And there's a lot of, like, come on, James, like, get the yeah like you have a license to kill and there are scenes where you believe it but i forgot i used to always defend him like oh i don't like you know there's things about roger moore seeing you know, pierce brosnan but like connery you know he had that glint in his eye like i believe he had a license to kill i forgot about all the moments 
where he's like yeah. kind of dicking around a lot. Well, it might have been nostalgia because I, that's I com I completely agree. And honestly, um, I I had that feeling when I watched one of the movies in the last couple of years. I can't remember. Uh, it might have it probably was you only live twice, but I, I watched it and I had that moment where I was like, "Have I really misplaced my investment in Connery is Bond? The rest are just actors playing Bond." Um, and yeah, I may have a very different opinion of who is Bond and who plays Bond. Because we've also had the discussion of who's your favorite, what's your favorite album compared to what is the greatest album? What's your favorite movie compared to the greatest movie? It's not always the same thing. Yep. And it, it, it applies as well to James Bond movies uh, and and uh, actors playing the character and their, their whole vibe. Because each movie changes vibe-wise with whoever's playing Bond. and. Uh, Connery, Connery always was at number one on my list because he just is Bond and everybody else is playing Bond. And I don't know if I, yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. No. Yeah, and I think one of the other factors in his defense is how he's so much, I feel like that vibe is more acceptable for the 60s. Right, oh yeah. But, yeah, there's, yeah. A, but there's a lot of, oh James, like to what he's doing. And uh, I don't remember all that. I remember, I remember him being flirty with women. I don't remember him dicking around in like the office so much, or even just being in the field and like, oh hey, blah, blah, blah. yeah. I because uh, the day before yesterday, I watched Goldfinger, and I definitely there was a moment where I was like, uh, I, you know, because keep in mind I saw Goldfinger probably four or five uh, for the first time, maybe six, and we were watching it with my seven year old, my wife. And we're watching, you know, Goldfinger. And my daughter said, why are you watching this? And I said, because I have to defend why this is the greatest Connery movie and possibly the greatest James Bond movie. And I'm watching it. And when he smacks a woman on the ass with a, with a folder and says something super sexist or, you know, something like that, I was like, I don't, this is not part of my, uh, you know, memory that, Connery is the greatest bond. I have moments from oh, like it's it's he's by the pool and he's like yeah. telling that girl to leave. I mean yeah, he, well plenty has been written and <laughs> plenty's been said about the elements from the sixties movies that haven't aged well. You right. know. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, general, was, thinking, there was a, you know, a different time. Yeah, there was yeah, a there's very there's, socially accepted level right, of right. quote unquote misogyny when it comes to just like, oh yeah, you slap a girl in the ass, she, you know, you know, in the workplace. Right. Oh, yeah, but uh, it's, it's just weird. But like you said, it it has it puts a very different but but when of, when you're on the job and you're getting briefed by, by like the CIA and you're like slap on the ass, hey. Yeah. Like, Slider shows up and he just yeah. you know, oh and then he and then he's leaving another chick within within the same afternoon yeah. uh it, it just he comes off as like you said immature he, he kind of has a i'm a junior high kid in a man's body with a gun and a lot of money and 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 some of the things he says are so juvenile that i would expect that douchebag that douchebag freshman in high school to say something like that to a girl and me go what and then back in the 90s i would go what in the hell's wrong with you um it, I, it, it just doesn't seem the cool that I, that i recall. right I, and I don't mean to come out the gate swinging because I remember when I started this, I was expecting to just be like, Connery. Um, but I'll, I'm, I'm 39 now. Going to be 40 this year. I just turned 40, so yeah. Oh, and um, I'm right behind you. And I, and it just went away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I remember now. The thing was that from the get-go, Bond has always been a fantasy, like a hetero male fantasy. Yes, there are women and, and non-hetero people who enjoy the movies, but I think the intent, the, 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 the target that you're going for is dudes who want to travel the world and bang a bunch of chicks and cool gadgets and drinks. and eh. um, But there's something about, even with his... I, I don't know. Did, did I get too old to find his 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 disregard for like certain parameters of his job? Like I don't think it's as cool as I think I did when I was like twenty two. 
or even when we thought when we were in junior high we're like, he's right oh yeah and you're like you know 15 and just you know I, there's yeah there's just something where i think i aged out of that level of silliness he has which is weird which is weird because bond is 40 something you know right. in these movies but and again, so it's, it's a fantasy yeah yeah it's strange it's strange because i remember uh you know my the majority of my life i would i would fight people over the greatest james bond movie of all time is goldfinger and i do think that it's definitely one of his greatest thankfully but, we didn't fight about that because i would disagree okay so i know i know what you're gonna say we'll get there i yeah. know what you're gonna say and we're gonna have you know what's funny is that we'll talk about that when we get there. but you know and then now watching goldfinger I, I don't know if i have that same opinion man i don't i don't have that same opinion well let's just start going through them okay. and hopefully over the course of it i'll find a way to say nicer things about it no, no, i'm like sure it. we're gonna say nicer it's kind of like me talking about batman returns i go in going yo i hate batman returns that movie needs to be set on fire by the end of it you're like you sound like a fan and i'm like i hate batman returns but i have so let me tell you all the things i like about it i have all the positive things to say about it but connery connery is still connery and bond is bond and he was the first to do it in in you know in feature film level high quality and there's going to be lots of good and there's going to be a hell of a lot of bad stuff yeah um, one of the first, okay, so Dr. No, which is one of the ones I haven't seen in a long while. There's Me only either. I watched it last week. I watched it last week and I was like, this is, I haven't seen this in forever. There's a handful that I, like, I revisit, you know, and Dr. No is not one of them. So, uh, right. Me too. We, we, we've always known that like Dr. No and For Much With Love, like everyone, scholars, general movie people always talk about like Goldfinger's the first like quote unquote Bond movie where like the formula sets in and it has yeah. the song and has the opening scene and i forgot that dr no like even for much with love is an opening scene but dr no is just like the bond theme into three blind dudes walk in and it just it's man, bizarre like, no i mean not even like a formula but yeah it's just the strangest opening it's bizarre well neither but it's just such a weird uh because i was watching it and there's like dots flying by yeah, the, the dots spell out dr no and, and, and i was watching and i go Oh my God, I guess this is where our man Flint got their whole thing from. Mm -hmm. And then when these three old men silhouettes are walking and they got their canes and they're walking in the opening credits, I was like, what in the hell is this? And the music, very piss poorly, if you ask me, just cuts to three blind mice. And I'm like, the nursery rhyme? Like, what is this? And and then it's these three, you know, old guys walking in Jamaica. And it's a really weird vibe. Like I that would be a, you know, I, I don't remember that. And it's very, yeah. it's a very strange intro. There is, there is no, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a very different from all the Bond yeah. films. I, I knew to expect something different. But I completely forgot how weird the beginning is. And I'm sure it's not weird when you haven't built a franchise yet, but once you have the franchise and go back, and I don't think I've seen this movie, God, since I was like 24, 25? Yeah, I, I mean. I, that's I, going I, on I, over, over 10 years since I last saw I, it. I, I would don't. say. For me, yeah, I would say the same for me. I don't actually have that much to like criticize this movie or really get into, but I, I my the one thing that really stood out to me, like holy crap, I wasn't prepared. I, there are certain things that are dated in movies. Fine, there are certain things that are racially dated, and you go okay. But I'm watching this, and he goes, "There's that secretary," and you see her from behind, and her hair's up and it's black, and I'm like. Oh, she Asian? She turns around and she's white. And I'm like, oh, because she's kind of dressed like the way you would dress like an Asian girl in her hair. And then they, she's got like the little Asian makeup lines. And I'm like, am I supposed to believe? Are they doing yellow face? No, no. This is, I'm reading this weird. This is just like a style, right? And then later in the movie, I'm like, no, you get to her place and you're like, yo, there's a white girl playing an Asian girl in this movie. And this is mm -hmm. fucked uh well, and especially no. because especially because there's other asians in the movie and you know they got black people to play black people in the movie why this one character they're like no no we can't cast an asian to play an asian no we're just gonna make everyone feel really comfortable about that decades later if people like i know that was a thing mickey rooney you know but i oh, wasn't God. expecting mickey rooney in this movie and and when you talk about little elements here or there in this franchise that haven't aged well number one with a bullet for me 
yellow face in this movie. Yeah, it would only be worse if they gave her Coke bottle glasses and buck teeth. And the like, teeth. Like, that's how close it is, though. Like, yeah, at least with Dr. Awful. No, his character is, like, half German, half Asian. So when right. he's got these sort of Asian vibes, we can tell he's not Asian, like, fine. I, I'll accept it. Although they had to combine the two, you know, worst evils in the world, Germans and Japanese at the time. Because that right. was so so anti-Japanese, anti-German post-World War II. So um, those really- are bad actually really like Dr. No as a villain. Oh, he's great. He's, well, when he's sitting there at the end of the table and he's talking and he's very calm and he's, he's perfectly his eyes, still. Yeah, and his oh. eyes are powerful. When he looks around and he says stuff, that actor is killing it in that movie. Yeah, the table scene is actually my, the best scene for him in that whole movie. Yeah, and it's his monologue about, you know, what the villain is doing, you know. And it's interesting because, and that's, and, and moving from him over to Connery, um, one of the, my notes that I, I took was, it's interesting how the secondary characters, you know, Money Penny, M, uh, Dr. No, uh, in those situations, uh, it's interesting how the movie seems directed and written as a sequel, as we already know, which I think is wise. We already know James Bond. We know who he is, but, but we don't. You know, it, it, they're writing it as, and this is who he is. So his personality, the things he says, even Dr. No, when he shows up, he doesn't show up until like an hour and a half in the movie. And he's written where we're finding stuff out about him, but he's not telling us about him. He just, he's there and we learn about him as we go, but it's not plotted. It's kind of written as if, no, it's a real guy. I feel like, I feel like this is one of the James Bond movies. Um, and obviously it's the first one where they wrote it as, we're not, we're not writing it as we're going to have people tell you who they are. They're just going to be who they are in this situation, and you're going to learn about them that way. And that was that's something that's really interesting about this movie oh. as well. And Doctor No, Money Penny, M, and Bond are all written as if you already know them, and they're right. your neighbor. When he goes into Money Penny's office for the first time, you already get a sense oh, that this is their routine. It's not like it's the yeah. fifth movie. But they it feels like it's the fifth know. movie. They must have been dating in real life at some point because those two have such great chemistry. Um, and you know she's great starts, in all of them. Well, she, uh, yeah. I mean, I I have nothing but love for her. She's she's outstanding. Um, but I love I love that Connery. You know, when he sits on her lap and he starts singing and they, he starts like posing like they're doing tango or something. And you know, he tosses the hat and all of that is written and directed and acted just like this is what we do. And I and it's it's really interesting because I, watching Doctor No. If I didn't know the order of the films, if I didn't know Dr. No was the first Bond film, yeah. that scene would have felt like it could have gone in any of the Bond films for any of the actors, written and directed and acted. It could have been any of them. It, it's, it's really great. Um, the, the only other thing I thought was interesting is that, you know, Honey Rider has stayed in my head for so long mm-hmm. for a whole generation of people. It's, it's the white bikini coming out of the water, you know, it's, it's, but what I didn't realize um, was that her character is so arbitrary to the story. Like they're going to this island to investigate something, and this girl shows up. She's and just she, there. And then I'm just I'm here collecting seashells. You're what? Yeah, you know, I come here to collect seashells. Yeah. Well, people are shooting at us, so you're gonna come with us and we're gonna protect you. But she stays on this adventure. And um I, I just didn't rec- Here, here's to me what you what you do in a franchise. I'm not saying this is the right thing to do, but this is what tends to happen: is you would start with like she's a, a spy character, or she's related to the the mission. She belongs to this organization, or she's the sister of this character. And then by the third or fourth movie, you're like, fuck it, she's just some girl. Okay, we're getting lazy in in our franchise. Right. We'll just, we'll just right. throw her in there. But they started the franchise with ah, fuck it, she's just some girl. <laughs> yeah, she, she just she's just there. She happens she's, to get. She's, yeah, she's literally just there. Um, yeah, and, and it's that, funny too because I, you know, the for her being such a standout Bond film, a Bond character, um, when people go, oh yeah, in, in Doctor No, when she comes out of the water and the bikini and the knife and blah blah blah, and um, it's interesting because the female Bond characters over time became more and more interesting and more and more uh, identifiable. And she is just a pretty girl who says her lines very monotone. And, uh, you know, like down the road with Jill St. John and all that stuff, they're characters. She's, she's not. She's an accessory I, there. I still like her. There's a certain everyday girl of vulnerability to what she's doing. 
but I do think that structurally, like I was just surprised how how basic they went out the gate. Yeah, I'm not oh, saying yeah. they need to be like a Michelle Yeoh type. That's, I like Michelle Yeoh. But, I, mean, I, mean, I don't know about that movie, but she was great. <laughs> she was great. Not everyone has to be that. But even like in From Russia with Love, the main girl like works for like the Russian government and she has mm -hmm. like a functioning job and she doesn't know that she's a tool in this system. Well, her She's not just too. like, oh, I, 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 I'm on the beach. I collect shells. Wait, what's happening? Oh no, yeah. let's run. Protect yeah, and in Russia with Love, her character has to be there or the movie can't take place. Mm -hmm. And that and, and I think it's it's almost like a living daylight situation where without that character there is no movie. And in this, she she's just there. She's a hot chick in a white bikini. <laughs> and and that's really all, <laughs> all I got. That's what I got for Dr. No. Yeah. Although I did appreciate that um for such a uh, right at the gate, they get to the island. I, I wouldn't call it a lair, but the facility that he has with the the it was some sort of fusion thing. But I was like, oh, right. first movie at the gate, we've got like a lair. Yeah, like, like a big a wide space in an right. island. Interesting, because yeah. what's one of the things I've been fascinated about and kind of wrote notes as I was kind of watching them all was like, like there is a formula that like even the Vegas sort of casual Bond fan is like, all right, so you have the opening scene, you have a song, you have a, a villain and a henchman with a plan, there's a girl, maybe a couple girls, and then you have the big layer and this. Yeah, but, and something, something else that, that, that I, I was surprised by watching Dr. No is that, that I didn't remember is the setting with all the different people there and everything feels very reminiscent, um, and, and this is, you know, obviously Dr. No's first and this is much later, but it's very similar to Honor Majesty's Secret Service and done better in that one, book and movie, with the with all the different people in the lair. Like mm -hmm. in Dr. No, it seems kind of, uh, it, it seems interesting that he has that many people there. So it's a, it's a weird, it's, it's a very, but it sets the precedent for lair, evil yeah. guy but in a gray suit, you know. What, what I found really interesting about all these, though, is I grew up knowing Goldfinger is the first Bond movie where it's like, this is what we know is a Bond movie. But right. having rewatched Goldfinger recently, I was like, but no, it isn't. It's the first one to have like the dancing girls and song. Well, actually, For Much With Love has dancing girls and a song. But like, right. it's the first one to have like a song, like an original song. There are a lot of elements in place. But there are still several elements. There's no big layer and, and no real interesting uh, In fact, it's interesting because Goldfinger, uh, the villain and his setup and what he's doing is much more uh, based in the real world. Yeah. And settled. Smaller and focused. It, and, and even though yeah. it's, a, it's, it's a mild skirmish, it would have a bigger ripple effect, which is usually how smarter villains would plot these things out. But even going into Thunderball, there are elements in Thunderball, but I would argue it wasn't until the fifth movie. Like when I watch You Only Live Twice, that's when I'm like, oh, this that's is a Bond one. movie. That's this the is one. where like all yeah. the things like click into place. Yeah, that's, that's, it's funny because one of my notes was uh, with Dr. No and with uh, From Russia With Love and Goldfinger, um, what's interesting about it and makes it kind of a, po a positive note is they don't realize that everything they're doing in these movies are going to become, you know, uh, commonplace and, Correct. And, 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 and commentary on how ridiculous these movies are. So they take it seriously and they treat it seriously. So it's actually really entertaining and has more value than when we get to You Only Live Twice and all of the Roger Moore and all the Pierce Brosnan movies where you have to go to this location. You have yeah. to have two women. You have to have this done. This has to happen. There has to be a lair. has to be one bad guy has to be done these certain ways yeah and i didn't realize till i was watching these and i'm like it doesn't become the formula until roger moore yes yeah or it's you know by the time you get to like roger moore and, and even like the brosnans it's always like the exact same formula but the pieces of the formula are in each connery movie and they get blended in a little bit later and i, I actually really yeah. respect the connery movies for yeah that. For the, yeah because they're also actually not as redundant as you'd think Oh, yeah, when you watch totally. them all, there are various elements. And I don't just mean tones, because that's the fun thing about the Bond franchise as a whole, is to watch how the pendulum swings between serious right. and goofy, but just little beats within it. 
it's, it's like, interesting also one of the things i noticed also when it comes to the the connery bond movies is um and and this is you know where i i, I feel it's very valuable for those films is each one feels like we're doing while well, there are situ some moments that like i said are, are similar to each other but they also are like this is the one where he's in japan this is the one where he's 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 stopping the guys from stealing the gold from the federal reserve this is the one where he goes on the train this is the one where he fights the guy in the mountain that's asian and, and they're japanese and german and and i feel like that gets lost in the later ones because it's like well this is the one where he's in space this is the one where he's a clown this is the one where they're in san francisco this is the one where he's in vegas uh you know where where it becomes very petty and they they're using beats and situations of yep. the formula from these films but overall as a tone you go oh my god this is the one where he dies in the first 10 minutes isn't that awesome as yeah. opposed to one where it becomes it, every movie is like this and it eventually becomes i feel like you know this is the part where he talks to m then this is the part where he goes to q branch right. and then goes to the field whereas like for example like obviously we don't even get to q until the second movie and he just shows right. up in the office and gives him like a cool briefcase but it's not till the third movie that like we go to the q branch office well, what surprised what? me was that we don't go back to Q Branch for the next three. Mm -hmm. He shows up at, like uh, in the middle of like the field and goes, hey, here's a thing you're going to need. And then on the fourth one, he shows up and he doesn't even give him a bunch of gadgets. He just gives him like a helicopter. Yeah. But, like in my okay, head, well, I, I, you grow I, I, up I, I, with I, like, and then he goes to visit Q and then he does this. And again, that formula isn't solidified under right. the Connery banner. It's solidified the leader. And it feels it feels more natural in the Connery films when those things happen. But it's interesting to watch those and go, "Wow, this became what every movie had to have have in it in mm -hmm. this order." But for Connery, it's real natural because it's you, you know, and we weren't alive then. But to watch it now, it's like, "Oh, this is the first time they're doing this, and they don't realize that in 15 years, this is going to be the standard of what they do." And people will hate the movie if these things don't happen in this su succession mm -hmm. uh and they don't know it and it feels very natural it's interesting and speaking of q i'll just say that when i was a kid i always thought it was fun that like he's always like oh james and james is like hey wait, there's this pen please put that down now that i'm 39 i'm with him going like oh fucking james put the pen down like i didn't realize i was going to ever relate to q but here i yeah, am a premature yeah, the older man. I get, yeah the older i get the more even even with the other bonds, even the bonds that I like better than others, uh, you know, even with Dalton, having him, you know, just oh my God, like grow up. I, I I'm totally like I'm kind of with you, bro, bro. Yeah. Especially with like Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan yeah. and Connery are both. There's like there's a little smirk on their face as they're playing with their shit, and only now am I like, quit farting around. Yeah, grow it's up. It's fun, but it was more fun for me as a kid. And maybe, I don't know, I need to loosen up. But, uh, as a teenager with a mullet chasing girls in 1994, it, it, it didn't, it, it seemed, ha ha, that's awesome. And now I'm like, that's He's not stupid. a normal spy. He's a cool spy. He doesn't take yeah. things too yeah. seriously. And that's, yeah, always been the, that's always been the weird balancing act of all the elements, you know, like, especially when you... Some people would say, oh, well, describe James Bond. Like, okay, well, you know, he, he, he jokes. He, he'll make like a dry joke after he kills people, but he's got a license to kill so he can be serious. But he can be like debonair and char uh, like charming, but also like he's sophisticated. And one of the things I always, I always took issue when people say he's sophisticated. I'm like, no, 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 he can be sophisticated. It's part of his training. And that's one of the fun things about Connery is that like behind closed doors, he's not a sophisticated dude. When he's out no, in the he, field, he, he can't knows. tell you about the year of this drink and the year of that drink and blah, 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 blah. But he will also, like, you know, eat Q's sandwich. And, you know, yeah, he, he knows what, what degree you're supposed to chill Don Perignon, but that's, that's kind of it. Yeah. Like, it's, yeah. That's one of the things, I mean, not to get off track, but it's one of the things I liked about uh, Casino Royale with, with Daniel Craig was I got the sense of he's a field agent. He's got a license to kill. Uh, he doesn't wear tuxedos very often. This is, like, him learning to like integrate into high class casino areas and be well that's and that's that's a feel i got with uh with uh definitely with dalton and lazenby as well which was this is a blunt instrument that knows how to yeah. dress to get into the room to take you out and yeah. that that and that's that's much more book um book bond uh you know as fleming had written him originally 
as opposed to what became the standard with Moore and Brosnan and even Connery. Yeah. But Connery does bring it when, when he needs to as far as the elegance and the, the poise. Absolutely. Because uh, from what I understood, I was watching the making of Dr. Noah. Like he was an unknown, complete unknown when they cast him. Or at least, I think he did like a commercial, but, but he wasn't a movie star. Um, but also the director of that first one, like, like, not only did they get him fitted for soup, but like, he's like, I'm going to teach you, like, I'm going to mold your posture. I'm going to teach you how to carry yourself, how this drink would be held. Like he, the director fancied himself a bit of a James Bond type and that element. Well, yeah, I know. I, I, I saw, I saw a behind the scenes where they described him as being a guy who believed he was James Bond. He was yeah. directing the movies and going, this is my life story, much like. Fleming, when he was writing it, this is this is who I am, or at least I see myself as, and that's what I'm doing. So he talked about to be a British gentleman. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the gentleman spy. Yes, yes, but he's not totally a gentleman. And and how many different elements do I like? I think Pierce Brosnan is a little bit too much of a gentleman spy. And and I have lots Connery. I, I I just remember Connery being more of a blunt instrument and. He, he's he's a little he's a little jokier than I remember, but um, he's jokier than I remember as well. But you Absolutely. know what? But you know what's great about Connery is in a fight, you totally buy him. Yes, in a fight. Oh my god! It, and and then that moves us back to uh, it, it, with, from Russia with love in the in the train sequence. <sighs> that is one of the best fights of all time. And, yeah, and then him, later him on, and Robert Shaw. So it, yeah, oh yeah. Such yeah. a far cry from Jaws, by the way, the movie Jaws. He's, man, you want to talk, Robert Shaw is one of the greatest actors of all time because all you got to do is watch From Russia With Love and watch Jaws and say, that's the same guy. Because uh, yeah. Jaws, Jaws I, I, I am very much of the opinion, is one of the greatest films of all time. And I think that Robert Shaw is a, a, a big, big key to that. Dude, yeah, they're, first of all, even before they really start just wailing on each other, yeah, it always impresses me when you can just have two dudes sitting in a train car talking and I'm like leaning on the edge of my seat. Yeah, or, or sitting there looking at each other after it's kind of, after the secret is blown and he's uh -huh. sitting there with a gun on Connery telling him what's going on and it's not, you already know what's going on because you've already been watching the movie. Mm -hmm. But to, when he does it, the tension is so high um, and you think, you really believe that Connery is not going to survive this train ride and... Uh, because Robert Shaw also dwarfs him and looks like he's when he, when they beat the shit out of each other, you believe it. Which we don't see again that feel after From Russia with Love until like Dalton, where you really believe this guy is not going to survive this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't think there's been. I mean, there have been a few silent. I mean, he's not that silent because he ends up talking. But for the majority of this movie, he's just sort of lurking in the shadows. And I'm like, wow, Robert Shaw. And he's also he he's Robert Shaw to like not say anything. And, so, and it works. Well, he's also a precursor to um, the, which is clearly based on his portrayal, the blonde uh, assassin in Living Daylights. Uh, he's clearly mm -hmm. based on the Robert Shaw uh, uh, agent character. The tall blonde in great shape, doesn't speak much, but is the fiercest killer that's, you know, the specter. And, and they do that again in Tomorrow Never Dies. Yes. Oh, but that... That one's a little blatant. That one's yeah, silly. It's very. And, they didn't get good and then I think, in my opinion, I think they, they try it again in Spectre with, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, I can't remember his name, but, you know, the animal. But Spectre, Spectre I, I buy Spectre a lot more than I do um, in Tomorrow Never Dies. It, it, it's What's silly. that fucker's name, though? Guardians of the Galaxy. He plays Drax. Oh. Yeah. Um, Batista. He's a player, right? Dave Batista. David Batista, yeah, he's in Blade Runner. Uh, I did, but they're also like, let's get this big dude who can fucking destroy Bond, and we're gonna have act. him not say anything. Yeah, he can act, but the guy in Tomorrow Never Dies, not, not the. Not, they didn't. I didn't they, but I didn't appreciate the fact that Dave Batista. I think his character is quite a callback. I think to From Russia with Love. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um. Yeah, one of the things I like about this movie is, well, first of all, Doctor Knows fun, and then I was surprised by how much actually like as far as sequels go like we're gonna have a whole boat sequence we're gonna have fights on a train he's gonna be running from a chopper in a field like this movie delivers 
in the best version of this, like more action, new locales, and it stays on the train for a while. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a nice set piece, piece, but the boat sequence is really rad. The chopper sequence is really rad. Um, but also, I, I forgot, because when, when I was in my late teens, early 20s, and I watched all of them for the first time, I'm like, from Russia with love, man. Oh, it's my favorite. Like, you, and I got to the end, I, I'm like, it's my favorite. So I'm watching it now at 39. Something I've forgotten was that him firing that... Uh, the flare? The, the flare at the barrel, and it sets the explosions on the water. I was like, oh, I don't remember that. I forgot about that. Rad, right? Great scene, and the boat is is kind of flipping at you, and he turns around, bam, and fires, and you see the, the, the barrels explode upward on the water. I was like, whoa, that's... That's pretty cool. I forgot about that. It's it's very rugged. Uh, uh, From Russia with Love is very much more sweaty and kind of smelly, and you're you're yeah. there. Stuff is happening than Doctor No was. Yeah. Seeing uh, it got to the point where like I ranked it so high in my head that I, I kind of stopped watching it, and this time just reaffirmed why I do still rank it so high. It also has a minimal amount of silliness. It treats its story considerably more seriously it treats its action more seriously. Like in general, when it comes to the Bond movies that are silly or not, this definitely is more of the not. Oh, absolutely. I, I, it's funny because even Goldfinger, um, I still, the, the serious moments in Goldfinger, uh, the end of the um, golf game, you know, uh, mm -hmm. when Bond is being kind of a dick and he even pulls his card out by going, yeah, I cheated you too. So, <laughs> and then, and then odd job crushes the ball. I'm like, Stay away from him. He's gonna beat your ass. Like there's yeah. there's danger there. And in, from Russia with love, there is danger there the whole time where you genuinely believe they're in peril. And, and Which that, I appreciate. Absolutely. It's still one of my favorites. It's not number one, I don't think anymore. But it's uh, it's my number two. I have a better appreciation for it because I once one stickler one stickler I had for it recently and i watched I it know. two years ago yeah and i brought it up to you because we've talked about bond movies and you would bring up from russia with love and there's something that always bothered me in it uh, i'm trying to look at it from a different perspective it always bothered me that a sex tape or a uh, suicide sex tape would ever um be worthy of blackmail for a secret agent that no one's supposed to know who he is i always thought that that plate is very contrived and built on yo, this is the fandom of this character. People know who he is. And I, I didn't like that. But going back and watching it, it's a much smaller part of the plot than I recall. It's barely, um, yeah. It, it's almost like an intent. Like, we did this as an intent to set you up, and it didn't happen. He becomes aware of it. Um, but, I, you know, for some reason, it was a big sticking point for me that how would a, why would a secret agent, why would a sex tape ever ever be blackmailed against a secret agent. No one knows who he is. Uh, it, it would be viewed as, which is why ultimately it doesn't work out in the film yeah. as well. But uh, I, I just, I didn't, I always thought that was a really weird plot point that I, I, I do feel could have been exercised from the uh, script and not mattered. It's, it's funny how um, things read to different people. Cause I remember when you mentioned that, I'm like the what? Like it's barely. But I, I went back and revisited the idea of it, and I still maintain that, like, I don't think it is a posable blackmail threat to him so much as just something we are going to plant on your two bodies to justify when people find you why there are two dead bodies. Right, right. That it was a that it, it was a murder suicide. Yeah, and, and then and it's just and then it's just a fun gag at the end to be like, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. yeah, 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 and, but, and yeah, and. and but just for some reason in my head, I remember the blackmailing uh, plot was more prevalent in my head. And when I, when I took a look back at it, it's a very minor plot point. I, I think the sequence is also obnoxious, obnoxiously long too, with you know them behind the curtain and all that stuff. I, I still think that it's obnoxious and something that just didn't need to be in the movie. Um, but uh, it doesn't... Um, it doesn't undervalue, it doesn't cut the value of the film, say like, you know, Bond dressed as a clown or throwing bolas right. that explode wood, you know. Uh, there was actually an element that kind of undervalued 
Goldfinger for me. How's that for a transition? Okay. Um, and again, this, it's, 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 it's a fun fantasy when you're a teenager, when you're a boy or a young man, or maybe when it's simpler times in the 60s. But in Goldfinger, when he's, because one of the things I liked about Gold, Goldfinger, specifically what I liked about Pussy Galore was what a confident woman she was. And we mm -hmm. start off with her and she's the villain's pilot and she's always by the villain's side and she's got his back and Bond's kind of flirting and she's not having it. And that was I great love, that she's not that having it. Love. And then yeah. later they get to the barn and some canoodling starts. And I like that the movies never really get into it. They just start or they, they show the end. But we're, we're, we know that Goldfinger's got this whole plan with the planes. They're going to be dropping the gas. It's going to knock everybody out, kill everybody. I forget what it does, but it knocks them all out so they can go into Fort Knox. So then everybody gets up and you're wondering, how did they all know? Because he didn't get the information out to anyone. And it's not till towards the end of the movie that you find out that like, Pussy gave him the information. And someone's even like, well, how did, how did she manage? Why would she give us that information? And you're like, wait, he, he fucked her real good? And now she's a good guy? Like, yeah. His dick was just that tasty that, like, I'm going to help. Like, nothing leading up to that indicated that she was going to, like, turn over against the bad guy. Well, and then Bond, Bond she plays it so confidently. And I Bond, just, that was, Bond, maybe when you're yeah, 16, Bond. his magic dick sounds cool. But, again, I get 39, I'm like, wait, what? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just not here. Like, that's silly. That's, I don't even think that's cool. I just think it's silly. Yeah, when Bond says at the end, I, I, you know, when it's kind of revealed that she, she helped them, because mm -hmm. um, I remember going like, oh yeah, she helped them, that's cool, right? And he goes, I must have, uh, must have been, she must have been drawn by her maternal instincts or something. And I was just like, you sexist piece of shit. <laughs> I punched him in the face. And I, and I, I genuinely like Goldfinger. At that moment, when I watched it the other day, I was just like, oh, you, you're a piece of shit. Like, <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to punch you in the face. And I love Goldfinger as a movie, and I love Gold... I, I, there are, I can tell you so many things about Goldfinger that I dig, the villain, and I do like Pussy Galore. I really felt like that was a, you know what, we're going to cut out any character development here because she's just a woman and he's got the magic dick. And I, I just, I hated that. I hated it so much, especially because pussy galore even when she shows up again after that she's still awesome when the plane is crashing and she's you know it's so great and also one of the notes on goldfinger that i wrote down was the plane sequences of it hitting the water it is shot so well and they're they clearly they're you they must be toy planes in a pool but it it looks really good they re, they they did a really good job on that like it's really well shot but the pussy galore character starts out so cool the barn is even cool until the, the the last half of it. And then when he, I must have, oh, her maternal instincts just pissed me off. And then the rest of it's fine again. So uh, it, it it seemed like a really bad writing, like uh, MacGuffin. Oh, well, the dick was good. So she yeah. And I'm, I mean, we're looking at it through a prism of not just our age, but also of our era that we're in now. Yeah, I... I, I I don't and know so how much, I, so much of my criticisms I know are a product of it's 2020 and I'm 30. Well, also, I, I just don't know how in 1995 even I watched that, um, and you know I've, I've I don't know how I watched that in 1995 and went. I do. Yeah, I get it. I it's because 15. it's because you're 15 and what are you always thinking about? Like when your your hormones are raging and there's a guy who's like, "Fuck you, this is good. Oh, he's so cool. He's yeah. so cool." So, oh god it's terrible <laughs> when he when he said that and it was funny because i'm sitting here with my family watching this movie and i just went i want to punch this motherfucker <laughs> so i just wanted to hit him i was just like oh my god why do i want to punch sean connery and i never thought like 10 years ago that we'd be saying this or having this conversation i just thought it would like if, if you'd asked me 10 15 years ago like hey let's do a video on youtube where we suck off Sean Connery be like yeah and then now I'm like well, yeah. hmm. um, yeah. well it's funny too another... my, my wife also pointed out when we were watching Goldfinger she said um she goes did his accent just get worse because right now he like doesn't have an accent and I was like I hadn't thought about that but in the first four Bond films his accent oh no Goldfinger is when it 
slightly shut my mush for dreaming. That's like the first time his his accent becomes a little stronger and it's still really weak compared to, you know, I found the cure for the plague of the 20th century in Ivory Washington. You know, it's just so different. It's weird. Yeah, uh, it got a chuckle. I was watching Goldfinger and Tracy just came out of the room for a couple of minutes, but uh, Pussy is saying something. Or she says something and, and Bond just goes, oh, push her. <laughs> like she just started giggling and I'm like well her name is, she's like I know what her name is it just sounds funny to hear that accent just say the words pusher yeah pusher so stupid <laughs> um one thing that really surprised me about Goldfinger because this is one I don't revisit a lot I don't want to say I had well it's just you, you you grow up you know with like that that Leonard Malton entertainment weekly type uh, level of just like uh, movie critics and movie yeah. journalists and every list, every goddamn list for Bond always has Goldfinger's number one. It's usually people's favorites. It's my dad's like favorite or the one that like he knew the best. It's considered the definitive Bond movie. So I always kind of rolled my eyes. I'm like, well, I, I, I was like, it's not that fucking good. But I watched it. I'm like, well, no, it is pretty goddamn good. One That's of the good. best things about it, especially because of my reluctance to accept how good it is, is how mid, like there's barely any action in this movie. It's Especially following from Russia with Love, which is like train, boat, helicopter, and this is like I think a car chase. Also, something that's really interesting about it as well is, uh, and I and I think in the newer Bonds they brought this back, and even in in the Dalton movies, and even in uh, Her Majesty's Secret Service, there is um, misunderstandings uh, when the the girl is on top of the hill and she's firing at Bond, and he's like, you know, holy shit, and jumping into the car, not knowing what's going on. That is a that is a flat, flat precursor to uh, uh, Living Daylights, the the short story, and which became the film, with the lady going, "Oh, I was shooting a Goldfinger, mm -hmm. and I, you were in the way." Um, and I think that's that's really interesting how this character, much like in uh, you know, obviously in the next film, um, oh no no no, I'm sorry, if, like in Doctor No, that just happens to be on the beach in the situation. This lady's sister is the one who's murdered with the gold paint, you know, in Miami, and she's trying to take out Goldfinger and accidentally starts shooting at Bond because she's a shitty shot. I love that he goes, "You're a terrible shot." I that was yeah, incredible. That's and, 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 and great see, intent for the character. It's a great throw off. Yes. Um, yeah, actually, it was really, I was really bummed she didn't stick around longer because I really liked her. Yeah, because you don't expect it. That's and that's and that's interesting to me that that they were defying the Bond kind of formula before it was a formula by going this is a, it's almost like psycho like i thought she was going to be the I, I was watching goldfinger the other day and i'm like god i don't really remember this character um i just remember pussy galore and i was like oh she must be the good bond girl where pussy is the bad bond girl and when she dies i was like oh and then it was also interesting to me that at the end of the movie bond well I, I i love this sequence where bond you know pulls the and which also became a cliche and they used in every other Bond movie afterwards where he says, ah, we don't need to be rescued yet and pulls the uh, the parachute over him and Pussy Galore as they make out. I That became, you know, especially in the Pierce Brosnan movies, it's like every movie ends with Pierce oh, Brosnan. Yeah. And, and, and that was like, that was the time it happened in the in the Connery movies and uh, he ends up with the bad girl and I, I loved that. I thought that was great. Yeah, I forgot just how many Connery movies end with like Oh, the thing explodes, and then I'm in a boat with a girl, and then, yeah. and then the thing explodes, and I'm in a boat with a girl, and we get yanked out and it's rescued right. by a plane. Oh, I right. I ended up on this island with a girl. We're in a we're in a. I forget, is it one of the Connery ones where they they pull up, like I think Felix they pull up in a boat and they're like oh it, oh and then he cuts the tie and the, yeah but there's a formula for you. Well, we make sure I end up on the boat and I fuck this chick at the end. Yeah. Well, and that leads to, and it's funny because having the opinions I do about the Pierce Brosnan and Roger Moore films, it's all the Connery film's fault for doing that. And it's funny that I always was so irritated by the, the Moore and Brosnan films doing that, but for some reason it didn't bother me that the Connery films did all of that. It wasn't obnoxious for some reason. Yeah, I wonder how much of it is generationally like the yeah. people who grew up with those now want to make bring that to the table and how much of it's just the cultural zeitgeist that way that you're like oh like my dad when i was a little kid he would explain like oh this is money penny he always flirts with her in the office oh he's, he's right. always got to kiss right. the girl at the end you know 
How much yeah. of that's just what people think about franchises before the franchise starts becoming what the fans consider it to be? Right. right. Um, but yeah, I, I really, I forgot like how kind of mature and, and or, or like modest Goldfinger is. And it's funny well, that's so beloved because it isn't that action packed. It's got right. a hell of a car chase and the car, the car does all the gadgets. So I get it. Yeah. Maybe that just stuck in people's head. But I mean, that really is also uh, the first time where I can recall that the villain captures him and just has him around a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, kill like him. and it becomes definitely a cliche later. But like they're even I think it's Goldfinger, Thunder, uh, Thunderball and You Only Live Twice. They each have the villain. It's just so cordial. Like, no, just yeah. stay. We're gonna have dinner, and I'm gonna. Well, yeah, and Goldfinger, they hang out and they play golf, and. But you the, know. Goldfinger is the most interesting one compared to the other one. The other ones, I feel like, I feel like Doctor Evil's son being like, "Just kill him," but Goldfinger, it feels like, one, he's 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 fucking with him a little bit to keep him around, but two, when he knows he's being watched by the CIA, and he's like, "Hey, get on out here." Yeah, and he comes out has the drink with him and pussy. Make, yeah, like we're gonna put on a show, so that. Yeah everything seems fine. Like there's a method to why he keeps him around just for drinks and dinner and stuff. Yeah. Oh, also, and, and Gold, Goldfinger is a great villain. He's so great in the movie. I love Goldfinger. And also beyond him being a great villain and Pussy Galore being a great kind of like lead henchman, uh, the opening uh, title sequence in Goldfinger, while the other ones were so complicated and like, you know, processed, this is like chicks painted gold and we're going to project sequences from the film. And when Connery comes up and it says his name, it just feels so epic. Great, great Bond song too. Uh, one of, I, easily one of my favorite um, Bond themes. That dun, dun. Uh, and then when they did it in, in License to Kill, I was thrilled that they brought back that sample. Um, and, I, and I love that opening sequence where it's just, projected sequences of the film on women painted gold i i think that title sequence while being one of the lowest uh like special effects wise it's very practical they're in a black room oh, yeah. they're gonna project on your face and for each character and there we go it's uh it's remarkably uh it, it's ageless it, it has not aged badly uh i think if they did that in you know in the next bond film i would be like yo that's just like well, uh, I mean, they great. started it. I mean, for Russia with Love is credits projected onto bodies. The only difference is they're not right. gold, and specifically right. they're belly dancers, which pays off to what happens in that movie. Right, right, right. This, Whereas, like, yeah, this one, this one is is themed differently to where it's more that they're not dancing, they're not moving, they're not layered over each other. They're just there, right? And they're almost the screen that's projected. I I like the simplicity, but it, I feel like it hit the target exactly right where you're, you're hyped for this movie during the credits. Yeah, and it's funny that we're talking about the credits because like, whereas like Goldfinger, I think, here's the first time we have like the Aston Martin and Q branch scene. Thunderball to me is the first time we're like, all right, we did two movies where they're projecting credits onto a body, but Thunderball is like, no, we're gonna do like, here's some pageantry. We have silhouettes, we have colors and women swimming and it becomes, to me, that's when it became that cliche. Yeah, oh yeah. That became the formula like, for the credit for that. Yeah, and that became the thing that spoofed is, you know, the silhouettes and the, I mean, do you ever, like, I remember uh, Spy Hard with Leslie Nielsen. Of all the ways to do the opening credits, it's silhouettes and people swimming. Like, that's right. where it comes from. So I guess that moved us into Thunderball, right? Yeah. Um, Thunderball, I, I, had a, I had a lot more notes than I was expecting going into this movie. Um, because I I forgot that the opening of the movie is like Bond's on retreat mm -hmm. at like this health place, and it's just like pure coincidence that like some dark shenanigans are going on, and he finds that guy's dead body. Right, right. And then later, once he's like on the mission, like oh this guy over here, he's like no no that guy's dead. I saw him and I'm like, wait, the first 20, 15, 20 minutes of this movie, like the catalyst is, is just purely by accident. I, I just, I don't know if I'm complaining so much, but I was just surprised Bond just happens to be at the right place at the right time. And that happens to lead into the mission he gets assigned to. Right, right. 
That's oddly convenient. Eh, I just don't remember that. And I guess we're just going to be okay with it. But I remember at 39 going, that's a little weird. Well, it's funny because in high school, it wasn't weird at all. But right. now it's just very like, oh, well, that's convenient. Like, here we go. That's, and even, and it's funny because in, and, you know, it's, 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 you know, uh, illegitimate cousin, never say never again. They rewrote it as in bond. If you're going to rejoin out, out of retirement, rejoin, you know, uh, the secret service, you are going to have to go get in shape. And when he goes, they come to kill him because they know bond is back and they want to take him out before he can get involved in the caper where in Thunderball, that's not the case. Thunderball, he's, he's there and stuff happens and here we go. Yeah. That, that's really all it's, it is. It's weird. It's, it's, it's and, and that's what's, that's one of the never say never again things where they were like, ah, oh, this doesn't make sense in 1983. So we're going to, we're going to fix that. Um, another thing I found interesting about the movie and this isn't a critique because I sometimes, it depends. I like when my heroes aren't perfect and when they aren't superheroes. Right. Bond fails a lot in this movie. And, and for such an earlier era where it's like a male fantasy, the guy doing this, the guy doing that. I like that he isn't perfect in this, but he, he, he does screw up a lot. <laughs> they've they've well, got, he, he and Felix have that female agent. Didn't stay with me long enough. But unfortunately, I only remember her as female agent. Yeah, but they have her at at uh, I think the Largo's compound, and he goes to like, he goes and sneaks in to get her, and she's in the killer, so he doesn't save her, and he's leaving. And he's running on the roof and he drops his gun and they hear him and they shoot at him. I think you're losing your gun. You didn't save the girl. Well, it's interesting because that he's, movie was written as the first Bond film originally before mm -hmm. Doctor No, or even even the idea of making a Casino Royale film, which they wanted to do originally, anyways. Uh, a Thunderball was written before it became a book, written as a screenplay uh, that Ian Fleming and, you know, and company wanted to put out a, a character that would be identifiable and work in features. And it's interesting, all the flaws that Bond has yeah. in Thunderball. Even maybe, the climax. You know, you know, time thing, you know. He's, he he uh, knocks out the one guy, takes a scuba suit, goes with them, and then, like, gets identified, and they all shoot at him, and then they leave him behind. Like, I just... I don't know, maybe after three movies, it was mildly refreshing, but also surprising. Yeah, yeah, that he's, that he's, he's, he's flawed, and he, he'll, he, you know, because, you know, his nine times out of ten, much like the idea of, like, oh, he magically bumps into the people he's looking for, is the unluck is, is just as common as the luck. Yeah. <laughs> kind, of a, kind, of a, kind of a Captain Kirk thing, you know, in the show, Captain Kirk made the right calls, and then the features... You know, in Star Trek Two and Star Trek Three, even the first in the motion picture, they made sure that when Kirk said, "Here's the stance, this is what we're going to do," because I have to make the decision who we are, that two out of three times Kirk was wrong, and and I and and that might have been you know what was what was attractive about Thunderball because my mom, you know, to this day, talks about uh, when she read and went to see Thunderball and how it's the greatest James Bond film of all time because it's just it's so great, but it's, it's well, because you know, Bond is not perfect. It has a lot going for it. I started this one um, not that hot on it for the first like 30, 45 minutes. I thought it was fine. But the momentum of it, when yeah. you get invested in, I can't remember her name, but she's like, she's the bad guy's girlfriend and she was the original dead guy's sister. Domino, Domino. Domino, you totally get invested with her. First of all, the first lead Burnett Bond girl, thank you. Yes, thank God. Three movies in a row, blonde, blonde, blonde. Not interested. Got a proper brunette, and she's awesome. <laughs> um, and then the movies, like the 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 action, like the last what 30, 35 minutes of the movie are really solid. As far as are you coming in to see a spy action caper? Well, we're gonna give you some good spy action, and not just fisticuffs. But first of all, the fisticuffs in this movie are pretty damn good. As far as the oh yeah, well especially the underwater. The bra is like great, the but then also there's fire, but yeah. But between all the underwater stuff, we're giving you something that you don't normally get to see. It just it really delivered in its third act in a way that I hadn't seen in a while for a Bond film. It's really, I think, pull out all the stops, and the fact that Domino pulls the trigger at the end. Oh yeah, that because James is fucked at that moment. Oh yeah, he's like toast. he's gonna die. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, I, I just dig her for that. I, I dig Domino. Yeah. Absolutely. And to be fair, there was, there was a, in Dr. No, there was a brunette that like he's going to bang, but he's got to go to Jamaica. And then in From Russia with Love, they're like on a date. And he's got to go again. And she's like, oh, golly, James, you know. Oh, you're but talking about the doctor know that he meets in the casino, right? Yeah. Uh, was, yeah, in the opening scene, yeah, he's playing against her in the casino. And then they're having a picnic at the beginning of From Russia with Love. And she, again, she's like, we were going to bang, but you had to go to Jamaica. Can we, you know, and apparently she was supposed to be a recurring character for all the Conneries. Well, that's awesome. And the running gag was like. It never happens. It never happens. He always has to go. <laughs> and fun trivia, the girl who played Money Penny had her like they said, "Well, we want you in this movie, and you could either play Money Penny or this girl." And she's like, "Oh, I'd rather play Money Penny. I don't want to have any like because I don't want to be in mild disrobe." And she picked the right choice, I think, because she's great in the part. But yeah, apparently she was up for but that she part. Plays with multiple bonds. I mean, she's she's Money Penny in, in you know oh, yeah. in all the Roger Moore movies too. But anyway, after seeing two brunettes get kind of, you know, or the same brunette get pushed aside, it was nice to have some leads. Well, being a brunette guy, I, I don't know what was Bond was thinking the whole time. <laughs> um, another cliche that really starts to solidify in this one, because, I mean, Spectre is mentioned in Dr. No, and we see, uh, like, Spectre offices, and we see, like, you know, Blofeld and the cat, but we don't see his face in, in For Much right. Love. But this is the one that's like, not only do we have Spectre and, and, and all that, and first of all, you see Blofeld in the chair again without seeing his face, but you do see a bit of hair on the side of him. Um, but this is the, the, like the council room. The room with the Yeah, chairs. the famous one. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. again, they're not all in the one movie, but you pull this element, that element, this to me, I was like, oh, this is where the big council room full of people in the chairs comes from. Neat. I will say though, I didn't very, think the villain. Awesome powers, yeah. Yeah, the villain wasn't all that though. Number two. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't stick. In fact, it's one of the rare things about Never Say Never Again that I would actually prefer is that dude. Uh oh, it got controversial. I thought. I just thought he had more presence on screen. I thought, I thought he commanded. I thought there's a lot of like about Thunderball. The villain doesn't really hold my attention though. Well, and you know, and here's here's something else that we've forgotten to mention about the other um, uh, all these these bonds so far is uh, Felix Leiter. Um, I, was, I was gonna get to him. Hmm. The first the the original Felix Leiter in Doctor No, um, I like him because I like the idea that he is an American Bond that we could watch a movie about as well. Like he's he's a badass and, and he has good swagger player. and he has yeah, style. No. He's a and young I'm, dude and he's kind of oh. cool. Yeah, he's Bond's counterpart that's American. Yeah. And he's kind of funny. Like, yeah, they were like, oh, we can't have that. So they made him an old guy, Goldfinger. <laughs> they, they made him a fat guy, another one. And they made him another old fat guy. And then they made him a hip old guy, and another one. And it just got worse and worse and worse. Where originally, the first guy they had, I think it was the right direction. Because eventually, we get back to that anyways. I actually think um, the one in Thunderball is kind of cut from a similar cloth as the first one. It's the Goldfinger one oh, to me. Great. It sticks out like a sore yeah, thumb. Great, the great he's, 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 he's got gray hair and Thunderball, but he never comes off as too old. And he still, to me, has a personality. He's still somewhat kind of stylish and cool. Like, I really dig his personality he's in Thunderball. He's wearing sunglasses at night, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but in Dr. No, I feel like he's, he's wearing ladies sunglasses, which is kind of why I dig him, is he's just really stylish. Yeah, Jack, no look was in, bro. Even on dudes. Even on dudes. I, no, I I, as far as recasting, I, I'm actually fond of, of the, Thunder, the third Felix in Thunderball. I like the first and the third a lot when it comes to yeah. this. this I, I think the first one is, is the best. I think he's, he's... I would have loved to have them do... Uh, Felix Leiter films where James Bond makes appearances as well and maybe maybe they thought that at first but then they were like ah we don't want we want Bond to be the cool guy where Felix Leiter is just kind of there so yeah agreed <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah and Thunderball and that ending that, that underwater uh duel where you kind of don't know who is who and then when um Domino you no, know, and then once again, when we get to uh, Never Say Never Again, that kind of happens again. Yeah. Um, when she, you know, takes Largo out 
uh, it's one of those things you're like, oh, because you don't know, I don't, I didn't, you know, watching that, and even in the book, I guess it's written, because I haven't read Thunderbolt, but apparently in the book, it, it is in a situation where you don't know who's shooting who, and when it's, uh, when it turns out to be Domino taking him out and uh, to save Bond, it, it's a really interesting, you know, the, the whole brother thing, it, it's really interesting. It's really, it, it's really well done, and I think that that was probably where uh, they should have stopped making James Bond movies, to be honest. Um, <laughs> in, in, in relation to the character in the 60s, they should have just stopped and then revisited later on. Well, I will say it never gets, yeah, it never gets as good as the second, third, and fourth movie. Yeah. When you, when you follow. For, for, for Connery, anyways. For opinion. Connery. I'm not talking about uh, Lazenby, but just the, seven, the six Connery movies. Yeah, I think, I think, think of the Connery films. I think that that's, and, and that moves us into You Only Live Twice, but well, I think. Did one, I skip something? No, just one last thing. I will, but finish your oh. point. Oh, uh, I oh was gonna... yeah, I, I think that that, that, yeah, I think that that was, that was the end of the, these are solid movies. You don't have to worry. Here we go. Yeah, the other ones will give you more. T- I mean, the things that if we're being negative about stuff, if you if you look at it all, they're all nitpicks. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. They're not as nitpicky <laughs> after this. Um, but one yeah. of the things I really love about Thunderball is I just personally, I really like underwater photography in movies. Oh, good. And I was just fascinated by how you stage that and getting your crew under there and how you light it and how bodies move through it and how light reads through it. It's just, just something nerdy I like when, when even, even bad movies, like even Alien Resurrection, I'm like, oh, but it's got some good underwater photography, though. It does. It really does. <laughs> terrible. You know, I, I think, I think yeah. that movie is one of the worst films I've ever seen. I but, know, but that but underwater it, sequence. But that is, underwater sequence, I was like, yo, this, I feel like I'm reading a comic book and it's done so well. The sound is great. Uh, the, the, when the, even when the alien pulls that one girl back and it goes out of focus, it's incredible. Yeah. It's so well done. So yeah. what fascinated me about Thunderball was, you know, it, under, underwater camera techniques have evolved so much over the years, but to be doing that in the 60s and to be doing so much of it, because I'm watching this going like, all right, here's scene number two underwater. Here's number three. And uh, I mean, also the pace of it. I, again, I, I tend to gravitate uh, I've accepted this over time. I tend to gravitate to the little more mellow Bond movies that are a little more grounded, treat things a little more yeah. seriously. I can have I fun, can. but I prefer them a little serious. And the whole plane and then going underwater and meticulously getting the... Uh, there was something in the 60s also about pacing that we don't have now. And you could see it in Never Seen Ever Again, how quickly they retrieved the bomb in that movie, Bombs, versus how meticulous the process is of getting it and bringing the tarp over the jet and all that stuff. Um, but the last, I'd say half the movie's underwater photography. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, like, because it they, feels like half. And that's it's great. great. Yeah. It feels heavy, it feels, it's heavy sided in that and it's so well done. I'm yeah, sure it's great. It's, so, I'm sure it's the worst, worst time of the director's life having to do all that nonsense, but it, it's so well done and it comes out great. Yeah, uh, I love it. That it's, especially for the time, like it's shockingly good. Um, but yeah, you, you were talking about moving on to uh, You Only Live Twice. And, and, and you know what's funny is that I remember, I remember where I was the first moment I, I saw You Only Live Twice as an adult. I was 19 or 20 years old and I was in my apartment um, and it happened to come on TV. It was one of those days where I was doing laundry or something, and I was like, you know what? It's Saturday, I'm gonna watch James Bond. You know, and it was on TV, and I was like, oh, you only have twice. Cool, and I, I know I had seen it, but I, I, I didn't remember it. And that opening sequence where Bond is in the bed, and it goes, shoot, and they go, ba 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 and they fired it up, I was like this. I, I genuinely was like, how the f- does he get out of that one? Like, how does he get out of that one? And I, I thought it was really, really cool because also they 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 go keep going they're like oh no he's dead here's his funeral his car he's in his body's being transferred and i was like this is like it, it shocked me at, even at 20 years old and this has got to be you know in the early 2000s late 90s where I, when it happened i saw it and i was like this is shockingly shocking yeah and i, I also respect i i tend to i i prefer when my opening bond scenes matter to the story 
I mean, Goldfinger is great, but Goldfinger is completely arbitrary as far as the opening scene goes. Whereas For Much With Love and like You Only Live Twice where it actually matters. Well, and fortunately also it's the, it's the beginning of the end, I think, for that film. I think that opening sequence from there, we're here, and then all of a sudden it just, it, 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 it works out, and then all of a sudden the film just starts radically nosediving and becoming more and more, uh, it becomes more and more uh, identifiable that we need to stop making fun movies like this. Yeah, it starts to become a little more formula ma- formulaic. Yeah, there we go. Um, but also, like, this was, more so than Dr. No, this was our first big layer. Like, it's an island and the, the volcano. The bro. volcano and the, the lake that's fake and this, this you know, and the monorail. And, and I will still always love it for that because that was our first time at, like, the big yes. 60s spectacle of, like, the layer you know like the incredibles and everything are complete and the incredibles oh, yeah. the incredibles it feels so fun and so great but um for some reason now watching uh you only live twice it it just becomes i i, I have this really weird moment where i realize oh this is where the movies took this terrible turn like and and, and watching watching you only live twice and enjoying it and I, I love the theme song i love the music in this film the it's so good the intro is so good and then by the end of it i'm like i'm enjoying this but this is the moment where bond took the terrible turn that led us to roger moore you know and diamonds are forever and oh it's that type of stuff and i i can't remember if this is the first one because i know yeah, this is the one where, like, you know, they, they pretend to kill Bond, and then he goes into the submarine or the boat, and, like, M has, like, an office on the boat with a coat rack on the boat. Like, we could still do the exact same thing, but in a different location. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I think they eventually do, and I think this is the first time they ever did that. Like, I know, yeah, because Q would go into the field and give him something, but this is the first time I recall, like, Money Penny and M, we're all going to do yeah. it out there now. Yeah. Um. I wouldn't call it a stretch, but it was like the first time that that became a cliche, that became a bit of a stretch. Yeah, well, um, yeah. And other I'll, moments, obviously, where down the road it becomes way worse. I'll, I'll tell you the inkling for me of like, or at least something that they shouldn't have done. And again, uh, it, it's hard for me in general <laughs> because I'm, I excel at speaking negatively about things and I struggle to make things sound positive. Um, but I'm watching this movie, and they're and he's he's gonna give him his ninjas to back him up. Okay, so we need to get to that island. Great, that's easy, right? He's like, no, no, no. To get to that island, we need to make you Japanese. And I was like, <laughs> you're gonna make you okay? What does that mean? No, no, no. That means they t- put him into a surgery room and they bring out these little eyelids, and they get the yeah. wig, and they make him Japanese. And they actually talk about like they're getting ready to die him. And he's like, well, "What if we just colored the parts that showed?" And you're like, "Oh, yeah, Ooh. yeah." I mean, How fascinating yeah. that there's an era where this 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 flew, that this was cool. Yeah, well, it's funny now because, like I said, I saw this movie in like 1999, 2000, um, the first time where I remember it, and I remember going, "Oh yeah, this is way better than the Roger Moore movies." And now I'm like, "This is." <laughs> just the beginning of that and yeah. i don't like it um and but then also once again the movie rebounds because it's awesome when he has the cool little gyroscope you know helicopter thing oh yeah it's cool and he goes there's in the, there's... i love it and i love what you know when the, the you know the ninja stuff and him it's cool but it's 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 all those moments where you know those ee, why are we doing this? this is a bad idea and then it goes oh this this is this is really great. And then you go, oh God, why did we do that? Oh, this is it's, really great right here. Yeah, it's, it's a weird. true mixed bag. Yeah. But man, when, when you get to the bad elements, well, first of all, they, they claim they die him, but he doesn't look any different. <laughs> uh, He's darker and never seen ever again. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and the other thing that just, if you want to nitpick is that they bring him this wig and it's like this little bowl cut, but he's on a boat with other Japanese men no one's got that haircut and he gets off the dock and none of the dudes have that haircut except for him 
And you could see them on the boat and you can see like the makeup line of the edge of the appliance. And I'm like, wow, he really like went to set on a boat full of Asian extras and like wore these eyelids. That's that's a rough day. That's a rough yeah, well, day. Yeah, it's one of those things where once again, we're expecting to pull up the Coke bottles and the buck teeth and, yeah. you know, it's, it's yeah, it's- uh, it's It was the 60s, dirt, 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 you know. That meant, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, Wow, you, you look at those things now and you just realize we, you know, the, I yeah. can't believe they did that. Like it, even it, even oh. without pulling it off. Yeah. Oh with, yeah. With the look, just the idea of like, no, no, we're gonna make you Asian. Oh, okay. Yeah, to give you the, we're gonna make you Asian. We don't have That's anything not. else we could. Uh, can I just like, no? Can I scuba in? No, no, no. We're gonna. Have to, we have to get you a wife. You have to get married. Oh, is she hot? Like, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. But uh. No, I re the opening scene's cool, and uh, Blofeld. Blofeld. Donald Pleasance. I mean, this is like, within the Connery era, like you think of, when, when you say the name Blofeld, this is the image that pops up. Right. Even though he's only, he's barely in the last act. I, I, I didn't write it down, but he only has a handful of scenes, and then he just... Well, it's inter yeah, it's interesting, because for me, I know that I know that costume-wise, and Austin Power-wise, and all that, this is Blofeld, and I don't regard him as the greatest Blofeld. I don't... No. I, don't, I, don't I, I have my favorite but, Blofeld, that we'll get to eventually, but it's not this guy. But two dudes in a chair that you never see, his face, then you get this one, which is minimal amount of screen time, Next movie is Majesty Secret Service. Lots of screen time, no scar. Next movie, next movie, lots of screen time, but he has hair in Diamonds Are Forever. The look changes so much. But this one, I guess maybe just because it, it was the first time that we saw him, it stuck so hard. But he's, if you just want to do the math of how, how, how long he's on screen, I'm surprised we don't regard like Telly Savalas more. See, tell in, us about in, in the public. Yeah, yeah no, tell us about well, He's my favorite as well. So, yeah. it, 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 Secret Service, it also. And, and we should save that for the Lazenby one. But. Yeah, yeah, we'll save that for Lazenby. But, but I mean, it's interesting that, the, and also, he's very cold. He, the, he's not angry, yet all of his actions are angry in this one. Like, everything, like, Blofeld is built up to be this very angry, um, immature, vengeful, um, pissed off child. But, he plays the character very cold and very emotionless, which is strange. It's almost like he wanted to take a riff on Dr. No and replay Dr. No and just say, this is Blofeld. Yeah, he's so cold, but his eyes are so intense. And I really think that's, that's just Donald Pleasance. Like, I don't think he can turn yeah. that off. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. His, the eye, when he, he does, the, he has these, his kind of bug eyes. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. It's a very different Blofeld from what we see in uh, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, big time. It's so funny because you, you grow up and you just, you know, when you ever see any documentary, any feature, any retrospective on James Bond, and they get to Blofeld and they always have that shot of him like leaning that first time yeah. you see him. And I forgot that he's very blatantly already in the room. And then right before that happens, some random goon just steps right in front of him simply so he can get that shot. I'm like, I remember going, why is that guy standing right there? Why isn't he, why isn't he just fucking move why is he all right i mean i guess we get a cool reveal shot but i think that's all he's there for they didn't yeah. i don't know nitpicks that's what i do well, but the, but the nitpicks the nitpicks are really what <laughs> separates the first few bond films from uh you only live twice because th that's where the cracks are starting to show and i feel like with uh you only live twice i feel like the audience wasn't like the movie is they're kind of like in on the joke like you, you can in that movie it feels like other than you know different from the other ones that they are intentionally doing things that they know will become jokes down the road um because like on, you know i don't imagine secret service they, they flip that completely um but it feels like they know these are going to be cliches in you know twice it feels like they know um this is silly um and i feel like uh, broccoli and all of them at this point went, you know what? I think we're done with uh, Sean Connery because he doesn't want to do them and we're, we need to get back to the book because in every documentary I've ever watched with, you know, um, with Maybaum and all those guys talking about stuff, 
They always say they wanted to get closer to the books, closer to the books, closer to the books. And in the next movie, they do that, but people loathe it for the first 20 years it sits out. And it's, uh, it's weird because, you know, you know, skipping after, because we're going to skip uh, Lazenby, we skip to Diamonds Are Forever, and Diamonds Are Forever is um, one of the worst James Bond movies, in my opinion, easily. By for lots of reasons. I mean, it's it's not it's the worst Connery one. I would agree, yeah. Um, and there are problems with it, but I mean, I wouldn't. I don't even know if I'd put it in my bottom five. I'd have to really think about it, but I I, I think I might. I mean, well, I guess because my my problem is truly each era. It's hard to be competitive um, for, so I have to like really remove myself and go to Roger Moore films. Cause I, I, most of the time I don't see the Roger Moore films or the Brosnan films as sequels to the Connery films. But I have another problem with, I don't see Diamonds Are Forever as a sequel to Honor Majesty's Secret Service, but it was intended to be the original script. And then even the intro with Connery looking for vengeance towards Blofeld for the death of his wife and Honor Majesty's Secret Service uh, is it's there, but they removed any mention of the wife or why he's after Blofeld, but he is, which is strange and doesn't work. And um, I was looking yeah. into it, and it turned out they had a different actor already cast as Bond for Diamonds Are Forever that was not Lazenby and not Connery. Um, and because uh, Lazenby had announced he was leaving and not doing another one, and they were like, yeah, we don't want him back, which I think is one of the greatest travesties in the Bond films. Um, but I also think that if they had recast Bond again uh, for Diamonds Are Forever, we would have never gotten uh, more Dalton, Brosnan, or Craig. I think that would have been, I think if they had a different actor play him again, it would have been the end of the Bond series. Yeah, I, 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 I never, never really thought of it that way, but I do see what you mean. Because I think I think that I think that the audience, even though I love Honor Majesty's Secret Service, uh, it's in my top three. Um, I I think uh, it's it's in my top two. I think that it's um I think that I love Honor Majesty. It's so good. We'll talk about that later. But it, I I feel like, and and I I'm trying not to talk about George Lazenby, but I, it, it's it's one of those things where I feel that unfortunately at the time the audience wasn't ready to let go of Connery, and so when they brought him back for Diamonds Are Forever, that's what got fans excited. And then by the time Roger Moore came on, um, and they also did such a big publicity thing about Connery supporting Roger Moore becoming Bond, um, that it helped continue the series. But I think if they had re if, if Lazenby was not coming back and they recast again, I don't think it would have worked. I, I also think that the, you know, that they, uh, there's also the trailer apparently you know, pitches that this is the ultimate Bond movie and it's done the way it's supposed to be. And, you know, they're being apologetic for Honor Man's Secret Service, which is really strange 40 years later, because to me, it's one of the strongest Bond films, um, if not the strongest Bond film. But it's, it's interesting that Diamonds Are Forever was supposed to be the answer. And to me, it's a really good Roger Moore Bond film. Like the, 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 you know, with the, the Bambi and Thumper and the, the car yeah. shot. Oh, being Bambi, here. Thumper, Bambi and Thumper are very Roger Moore. Yeah, and then the Even flipping the of, look of this movie, it starts it's to... Moore. Yeah. I, I, feel, I feel like, you know, Cubby Broccoli and all them probably made this movie and then looked at it and went, oh. Yeah. Yeah, arbitrary. Hot the chick chick yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, Bambi and Thumper... Uh, it's, I would love to have filmed this conversation when we were like 15 or 20 <laughs> and then like revisit it because I was I was thought like oh Bambi and Thumper that's fun that's these two you know not even henchmen but just obstacles but I watch it now yeah. and I'm not against uh, the male fantasy silliness of like we're going to have these two boxy ladies and they're going to have a fight scene yeah. cool yeah. fine whatever what I'm bothers me what bothers me now and I will, I will be my nitpicky self again, is that I don't buy 
in the fight scene that they are besting him. Yeah. There are lots of little beats where he's knocked down and you're like, well, you, you, he just stands there and takes the kicks and takes the hits. And I'm like, I've watched Connery do this a lot now. He wouldn't just stand there and wait to get punched in the face. It's a poorly, poorly choreographed fight. I would also like to point out he looks like shit in this movie. He looks like shit. In fact, Never Say Never Again, which is 13 years later. He looks, he looks better. Great. He looks great. Yeah. And then in, in, in Diamonds Are Forever, he looks tired. He looks bloated. He looks wrinkled. He looks terrible. And then also the clothes they're putting him in in Diamonds Are Forever. He looks like a, a 70s grandfather. It's really, yeah. really weird. Well, and not only, does he, not only does he stand there and take the hits, but also if, if, if he's going to get bested, I need to believe what they're doing as far as up in the ante for the fights, but they're not doing anything spectacular. No, they're just fighting him in the hotel room. I mean, it's yeah. like... I, yeah, I and, just... Uh, and the killing of Blofeld in the opening sequence is really stupid. Him drowning in, like, mud and stuff, it's just really really dumb yeah and it doesn't he says something like you know I'll, like now you're in i forget he it's not a terribly funny line it's just a line and i, I actually that's another thing about this whole connery era is you know there's a lot of he murders someone and says something there's only a, only a handful that i genuinely thought were funny and i don't mean that as an insult but i yeah. feel like that got milked more in the later movies yeah, well, it was better because it was they were exacerbated in later movies. Yeah, and they but they also made it where they're you know where we kind of waiting for them. Ah, there it is, you know. Yep, and it's not it's not as present in the in the in the Connery yeah. era. Yeah. Um, I I at first when I because I had never seen Diamonds of Forever until my early twenties when I was going through all these and having recently seen on my Angie Secret Service and loving it and the fact that the movie opens with where's Blofeld? I'm like, oh, this is great. Oh, this is great. And then that kind of goes on and he just sort of dumps him into some mud and you go, know, oh. And then the rest of the movie just sort of moves. I don't need him to be somber the whole time. I don't need him to be grieving over his dead wife. Um, so I'm not going to hold this movie against it that he's like, you know, banging some diamond smuggler now and whatever. But yeah, it's such a huge beat to just sort of pay lip service in the opening scene and then move on. Um, was weird. Clones are weird. The uh, Blofeld clones later on are weird. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? It's weird. Yeah. And, it, well, it, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't play a big enough part. Once it's revealed that there's clones, then you go, oh, and then? And it's like, well, no, we just, we had it for that scene. And then that's it. And then we're, that's all you get. It's really weird. I, I, I don't know what they were, they were doing. Like, the, the script has, is not focused. I feel like, I feel, you know, because, and, and we'll talk about this on Lazenby, but the last scene in On Our Magic Secret Service was supposed to be the intro into the next Bond film. So the, because they didn't want to bring back the cast, except for Lazenby, because they intended for him to come back for Diamonds Are Forever. And they were writing the script, and the opening sequence of Diamonds Are Forever was the last shot that ended up being in, um, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Uh, and then once they were wrapping the film and they were editing it, that's when Cubby and uh, uh, Lazenby had their passive aggressive fight through media. You know, it's, it's the equivalent of a Twitter battle now, which is where he, they said he's fired and he said, I'm not, I'm quitting. And they said, well, he's fired. And they said, well, I'm quitting. And then the movie came out. So it was like really bad PR, but, um, and then they just put the, the intro to Diamond's as the ending of Hunter Magic Secret Service. Um, it's just tonally it's just so weird to go into diamonds the way they did, where it becomes silly and funny. Well, it, it really felt like, again, the, the, this is the decision where the pendulum swung. Like, we tried to be more like the books. That didn't work out. I mean, it did for me, but... It works for me, So, yeah, so yeah we're going to swing back the other way. Uh, we were and, just... And let's we got to talk about the henchmen too. The uh, the oh the, god, yeah, so um, weird. So I mean, it's Mr. weird. It doesn't it doesn't make any sense, and it's so Roger Moore era to have totally. those Mr. Eight, Wint and Mr. Kind, Mr. Kind. I don't know. 
um, it was such a weird and 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 uh socially at the time it wasn't even an acceptable thing or something that people were like talking about and it's so weird um it's weird and creepy intentionally it's i don't know what they're doing with those characters yeah um the thing that i find weird about it is that okay i'm gonna get on my sjw super liberal high horse here but it's it's it on paper it sounds cool like we're gonna have two gay henchmen Mm -hmm. and we're not gonna pussyfoot around it like they're gonna hold hands that guy's gonna say a girl's pretty he's gonna be like ew what like we're gonna acknowledge that they're a couple but we're also gonna make them creepy and weird and that's what sucks um if you look at media for the last 50 years i've 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 watched a lot, read a lot about the coding of character sexuality, where even if their sexuality isn't upfront, the way the characters coded are beats that we associate with certain kinds of uh, right. sexual preferences. And the, 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 the last 40, 50 years of movies, if you're going to code a character gay, it's usually the villain. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and uh, it, it's one thing for the, it's, it's just a, a thing that we, Hollywood has done to code the villain as gay. But to code these guys is not, first of all, it's not even coding. It's upfront. But that, like, no, no, let's make them weird. <laughs> yeah, they... It, it, the, Why do they have the, to be so weird? Yeah, the fear of the fear of homosexuality in heterosexual men um, is so played up with these characters that they are evil but wimpy, but really scary, but super it's feminine. Icky. Yeah. It, like, like these are the guys, you know, basically, basically the fear that that these uh, gay men will treat heterosexual men the way heterosexual men treat women when they walk by a construction site. Um, it's, is, it's a very weird thing. It's very strange. This is your worst thing. Like if you're at a urinal and these two guys were like next to you, like, Ugh. yeah. Um, it's very weird. I mean, it's very strange. It's hard to watch too. It's, it's very hard to watch and it doesn't, come off as a Connery era Bond film at all. Like I know very strange. It it was Um, funny because when I was younger, I always, you know, from my dad's stuff, I always knew the story of he leaves Bond and then he came back and never say never again. He was really good and then never came back again. And then when I got older, I was like, wait a minute, he came back twice. He came back for diamonds. Yeah. Yeah. And then came back in a different production company's version of Thunderbolt. So he came back twice and Diamonds Are Forever is a really weird ass. Um, the Eon Productions, I I think at that point, were like, if this is what they want, we're going to give it to them. And they but did. But do people want weird? Because first of all, um, Bambi and Thumper are silly. Then the two gay henchmen are creepy and weird. And then Blofeld is also strange in this movie. Very weird. Charles Gray, I think that was his name. Yeah, Charles Gray plays him like calmly fussy mm-hmm. he has a weird intensity to him I, it's not necessarily bad but it's like the fussiest version of blofeld i've seen well uh, also it also comes it also comes up as, a, as another veiled attack on homosexuals at points because you you feel like he's a jilted lover type villain to bond in diamonds are forever uh, you, you get a sense of a little bit of history there yeah, it's weird. It's very is, strange. But, but then, which is why it's frustrating that, um, you know, Bond sh- sneaks into his office in, in his Vegas tower, and then he tears Bond down mm-hmm. and talks him into, like, so just go. Like, just get in the elevator and just leave. And that yeah. scene feels so weird for me. Because, one, I don't really ever believe that when Connery sees him in this movie, that you're the guy that killed my wife. It just doesn't- Not at all. Not at all. Um, I think that's not necessarily Connery's fault. I think it's just the production's fault for not even going there. But I remember being so frustrated when he gets in the elevator that this was the first time I was really like, you're the bad guy. Why are you letting him go? This is stupid. Of course you find out it was a trap. But I got more mad at Connery. I'm like, why are you getting in the elevator? Well, neither, but also when, when Why leading, you... leading into that sequence, when he's, you know, um, like, uh, like spelunking, you know, he, he's, he's oh. you know, on, outside the window. And he goes through all that trouble to get into that building. To be and talked then, out of it and get in the elevator? 
well, fuck it, I'll get in the elevator and bounce. I, I don't get it. It's right. So, and I, the, I, I shouldn't be smarter than Bond, but I'm like, don't get in the elevator. Don't get in the elevator. And then sure enough, it's a trap. The gas goes off. And this was the first time where I really felt more the so elevator, than any- The elevator fight is pretty cool. In that. Is that the same? Is that where he has that, that fight um, with the guy in the elevator? Yeah, that's when he's at uh, the Diamond Lady's place, I think. Yeah. That, that fight's pretty good. That's, that's the only part in the movie that I'm like, oh, this is a pretty intense fight. It's, it's clearly an homage to From Russia With Love. Especially when they finally fall out of the elevator. Because you can tell, like, oh, we have nowhere to put the camera right now, so just stick it fucking right there. Yeah. Uh, but, again, the, the, the Connery shows up. When he's fighting, even in that movie, even at his most tired looking, he's still committing. Oh, yeah. There's a... It's, it's, I've heard producers call it a smile. I call it more of a grimace, but there is uh, a grit and an enjoyment when he is clobbering someone and it's present even in that elevator fight. Absolutely. He, he is when he needs to be, uh, he enjoys being a brawler. But when he gets in the elevator, this is the first, this is the cliche, this is the Scott evil cliche of why don't you just kill him? Where you gas this guy and you, were, and you guys are playing it like you guys have a history. And after all that history, well, we're just, I'm just going to have my gay henchmen just take care of it. Yeah. yeah. And not only that, but you, how do they dispose of them? They just put them in a barrel at a construction site and walk away. After we've seen them murder all these other people. And they kill, do, and also. I mean, and that's dumb Roger Moore stuff. So bad. Yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, I don't believe that Blofeld would, would just let the henchmen take care of them. I don't believe the henchmen would just leave them in a construction site. This is all nonsense. Yes, yes, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's a Roger Moore film with Connery. And it's very strange. It's View to a Kill with Connery. And yeah. It's and I, I, I'm curious what, I, I have to do a deep dive into listening to commentaries or stuff about the decision, having the same producers and going like, all right, we're going to get rid of the scar for this movie. Okay, for this movie, he's going to have hair. Same writers too, same writers, same producers. Yeah. And sometimes same well, directors and they just wildly different each time. Well, Roald Dahl wrote You Only Live Twice, which is so weird to me. Yeah. Um, and, and that was the only one he wrote. And a lot of elements, I didn't know this at the time, um, but the whole capturing of the, like the missiles and then holding like the little the missile people hostage that like that gets repurposed in his novel of Charlie and the great glass elevator or really long oh, yeah. glass elevator. Like really weird. There's a lot like of weird the family stuff. is helping with this. Yeah. It's the strangest thing. Um, I've never read you only live twice, but I do know that it departs considerably from the book. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, because that also leads into on our magic secret service. We want to do the book. We want to do the book. Uh, the um, uh, for your eyes only. We want to sit closer to the book. Uh, uh, Living daylights. We want to. We want to. We want to be closer to the book than we the closer to the character from the books than we've ever been. I mean, the the opening of and what's going to it'll be Dalton talk. But that opening sequence is the entire short story, of Living Daylights. Yeah. Um, so it's very very strange. To me, it, it it's so a sort, far in all it's sort of thing that you see when you have different producers. But to have like the same producers and then constantly mix up the look and the relationships yep. between certain characters and Michael Michael Wilson talks about this in you know because he was a kid and he was you know work started working on these ones and you know and helped write some of the later ones but uh, Maybaum and all those guys they would sit down and go we hung out with you know Lazenby or we hung out with Connery and this is kind of how we feel Connery works as bond now and or roger moore or dalton or whoever at the time and they would write wildly different they would do rewrites on the entire script based on who the actor was that was playing bond and that's really strange to me that they don't go hey we're hiring an actor to play the part we want but they're like well we're going to write the movie to kind of suit this person's either you know anger or their violence or their comedy chops or it's just very strange and it's the same same team until uh, Pierce Brosnan for most of it. Same producers, but even same writers and same uh, directors in some cases, all the way until Brosnan. It's weird. Yeah. 
there's a there's a, a sloppiness to diamonds that isn't also present in the other ones that right. uh the thing that really threw me off i actually diamonds is, is another one that i didn't really revisit very often because i have uh, bad memories of just like for everything that we've said but right. um yeah. You know, and how stupid it is it like, well, we filmed the car going in the alley one way and like derp a derp, we filmed it going out in a different way. What if we just had to go boop in post? Like, I don't know. It's um, so bad. That, that sequence so, is the movie, movie ruining for me. It's, it's hard to watch that sequence and not go, I don't want to continue watching. <laughs> well, here's what kind of ruins it for me. And it's more of a usual mean picky production thing, but they introduce um, plenty of tool. They meet in the casino. Hey, do you want to get a drink? Sure. The next scene is them going into, like her coming into his room. Throw her out the window, fine. What's weird yeah, to yeah, me- Yeah, throw her out the window, that's right. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a fine scene, no complaints. Um, but later, I can't remember her name. I just keep calling her like the diamond smuggler girl. But uh, you know, she's the redhead. She's like our main Bond girl. You're St. John, bro. There you go, thank you. Oh man, she. Oh, sorry, bro. That um, is young man, that yeah, that was definitive. And me, I also oh. she was in the Batman television series, and she that's right. Robin, and oh my God, that that is a beautiful woman. Um, she has a house that she's been put up in by Mister Mister White slash uh, Blofeld. Connery goes to her house. Well, she comes home, and Connery's really waiting, mm -hmm. and Plenty of Tools floating in the pool. Right. She's like, what's my, what's my brown haired wig? He's like, oh, that's, and then, she, oh my God, it's a dead person. And the camera goes, and it's plenty of tool. And he goes, oh, she must have stumbled in the pool when she came here looking for you or looking for me. And I'm thinking, wait, what? Yeah. I understood the words come out of your mouth, but why is plenty of tool dead? Why does she come to the house? Why would she come looking for you here? What? I don't. Uh, I, I must have did I did I bump the chapter skip? Let me let me go back. It feels it feels Went back, like rewatch everything. I didn't miss anything. Turns out there are deleted scenes. Well, apparently first when he first bangs Jill St. John, when like she sneaks into her purse and gets her card, which has her address on it. So now she's like got the house to go to. And then there was a deleted scene where she comes in there and uh, the two henchmen think she's Jill St. John in a brown wig and kill her and put her in the pool. Both of those scenes are cut. Both of those scenes make the next scene make sense. You can't have A, B, C, D, yeah. cut out B and C. So weird. So, so weird. weird. No yeah, other Bond movies have ever done that. The yeah, the editing is all over the place. The acting is all over the place. The characters are all, it's a really weird, it, to me, it's, it, like I said, it's, it's as jarring as trying to watch A Beautiful Kill. It just seems all over the place. Everything is just so yeah. all over the place. One nice little thing I like about it, though, is uh, because we, we've established, I think, starting with Goldfinger and definitely going to Thunderball, that he will bang the bad guy, at the, you yeah. know, like the female henchman. But I like that this one, like, Felix is like, eh, like, he's not approving. Like, he's like, you yeah, know, she's, we're gonna send her to jail for this, right? Bad guy, yeah. It was nice to have like a voice of reason being like, you know, you're banging the bad guy. Just so we're clear. It's very it weird. Felix, right, yeah, it is Felix, a, a, an older random Felix in this one. Yeah, an old, an old funny dead Felix, which and, is strange. Yeah, and, and not, uh, yeah, he, there's not, he doesn't have much to work with, but he doesn't give me a lot in this one. But uh, yeah. But Jill said John has personality, I'll give her that. It's a weird movie. It's a really weird movie. And I, it's, it's strange that, that that's what Connery came back for. Because, you know, when I, uh, you, know, and, you know, and after that is Never Say Never Again, which is outside of the canon of Eon. Mm. But it's one of those things where I feel like whatever the conversation was to get him back for Never Say Never Again, the product, while still being a, you know, very clear remake of a movie he did 20 years previously, is still better than Diamonds Are Forever. Uh, it makes more sense. It's better directed. It's better shot. It's it's better edited. It makes sense. I was surprised uh, how much I enjoyed it because I swear to God, haven't seen it since I was eight. 
or nine well, years funny, old. Yeah, today when I messaged you and I said, are we going to talk, never say never, and you were like, no, because I haven't seen it since I was eight, and I was like, bro, it exists. We got. Well, talk I about also it. don't, I just, I always, it's not a broccoli, broccoli production, it's not Eon, I just, I don't count it, I just don't. Right, right. Um, but I'm glad I did, because, I mean, first of all, it wasn't great. No, it's not great. But it wasn't bad. It's not bad. It was all right. Anyway, I'll you tell know you what, what? After bro, the last one I saw, yeah. I'll take all right. <laughs> well, not that, but also, if you went and saw, you know, because I just watched Octopussy. I seriously watched Octopussy oh, so. weeks ago. So in my head, it's fresh. Uh, and for all of the, the bumps and bruises, which I, you know, we'll talk about eventually, we get to Roger Moore, but going back and watching um, Never Say Never Again, uh, they came out the same summer. Um, yes, they did. And I, I would have easily gone, yo, Never Say Never Again is so much better. And it's a remake of a movie I've already seen. It is so much better than Octopussy. I would rather go see this 10 times before watching Octopussy once. So. I, you, I've never, I've been vaguely aware of the fact that like someone co-wrote Thunderball and I know this has something to do with the rights to who had it so that I can make my own bond, but the legal stipulation is okay, but it has to be Thunderball. You can't just make up anything you want. And, but I forget what the, what the real reasoning, what the drive was well, to the, make well, this. The situation, the situation was is that the books, the, the Bond books, Ian Fleming had already put them out, but then he was in talks to do Bond for this or Bond for that. He sold the rights to Casino Royale. They did the TV movie, and they called him Jimmy Bond. And he was an American. It was completely just crap. Um, and then they, he had met with some writers and producers that were like, hey, you know, we love your book, and you love your books and your characters and we want to make a movie. And he was like, cool, let's do it. Um, and they put together a, a script, a, a feature script that apparently wasn't very good, but it was a, a feature script that eventually became Thunderball the book. Um, and the title was Thunderball. Uh, the characters that were in it uh, included the introduction of Blofeld, uh, Spectre, uh, that type of stuff. And then it worked its way into other Ian Fleming books. And when they were going to make the movie of Thunderball, um, those original producers and writers came up and said, hey, listen, he didn't credit us in his book. And we created Blofeld, not him. And he couldn't prove otherwise. Um, and so they said, okay, well, we own these, char these certain elements of the Bond characters. And uh, so he needs to credit us as writers and creators of these care of, of bond and so for that point in in the thunderball book and some of the other books that happened they were credited it's kind of like the bob kane thing where other people are like yo we were in the room we came up with the ideas you little finger to, and all that yeah yeah you have to you have to credit us as well and so when eon productions was already in production of thunderball these these lawsuits happened in order to get through the film and get the film out um they said cool great we'll pay you as a writer and a creator will license these characters from you. And because of what the lawsuit uh, stipulated, they said you can remake Thunderball as many times as you want, but you have to wait 10 years until after our movie. We'll pay you to wait 10 years after our movie comes out to make your version of Thunderball. And he said, great. And then, you know, he was very, the, the you know, writer was very lucky to have all the drama happen with Connery and Lazenby and then Connery and then with, um, replacing Connery with uh, Roger Moore and there was a certain section of the fan base that was like we only want Sean Connery we don't support anybody other than Connery he knew that he also knew that uh, he, apparently when they started work going into pre-production he signed Connery on as a creative consultant for the Bond film and then wooed him back into playing the character and um, you know it was directed by Irving Kirshner Irving Kirshner yeah man um and, and it, i will direct it pretty well it's directed very well yeah um, the the uh kim and and this is also something that's bothered me with some of the earlier bond films is and jill st john is is does not fall in this category and neither does pussy the lore but the other females uh cast in the connery films i think before goldfinger and even sometimes after the female leads are so weak that they're not names they're not people you know. They're not people that you remember. 
and they're just pretty girls that talk and don't really act. But in uh, Never Say Never Again, both the female um, antagonist is outstanding and famous and sexy and scary. Um, and her death is a great payoff. <laughs> uh, I love that. Oh my God. He, oh, we need to talk about that. Ooh, I was like this. I love that. And Kim Basinger, um, you know, Kim Basinger and Sean Connery, you're like this, really? I don't, I don't remember this. And you watch it. I, I, I think that it's uh, much more attractive. I'd rather watch Connery remake his movies a million times than watch the, the route they went. Right. I just it's, just, it's just creepy that he gets to be old. He gets to be 53, but like the blonde girl still stays in her 20s. And I'm like, okay. All right. Well, it's just, it's just like, it's just like, a, what's his name um, said in that movie? He goes, I keep getting older, but the girls just have the same age. It's Days so confused. weird. Yeah. <laughs> but it's more believable than Diamonds Are Forever because he actually is in really good shape. The tan is on point. The wig is on point. He looks great in Never Say Never Again. Yeah. Diamonds Are Forever. He looks like, like in Diamonds Are. Diamonds are forever. I would never believe that that dude could land Jill St. John. Not ever. But then in Never Say Never Again, I'm like, I kind of buy a lot of this. Yeah. Um, really random. I'm just going to list off things I liked about the movie. Uh, the motorcycle car chase. So when he goes, so boom, so good. Yeah, so good. from the launch out. But it's so well shot and so well edited. And, oh, it's, it's just. I love, I love the, the, the motorcycle. There's chase. no fat on it. It's just perfectly. Tri- oh, it's great. Um, and the fact that they, they catch him, gets in the truck, start lifting mm-hmm. the door for the truck, peels out again. Awesome. So um, but then I think that's what leads into uh, the, the henchwoman's death, right? Where he's in the cave and he fires the little... Yeah, because he, he drives in there, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was I, ridiculous I, to I, me. I, it is it, it, it I, like, that. I thought it was funny. It sounds like you like it more than I do because it made me laugh. Because um, I'm trying, I actually rewatched the scene like three times to try to get a read on it. But she's like, because first of all, they're in the, they, he goes on the boat with her and they bang. And unlike all the other movies where they cut away, this is the 80s now. And the 80s, I think, birthed the gratuitous, the needless sex scenes. Uh, so now we actually like, not like close ups, but we actually like cut to the sea and then cut to them getting it on and cut to the sea and then cut to them getting it on. So we well, totally know, mentioned there's a there's a great cut in that scene. This is all Irving Kirshner. I'm going to give him props because it probably the editor, but I love it. I know they're, they're doing that, and the boat starts rocking, uh-huh. and they're, they're doing the dirty, and all of a sudden it goes boom, and he seems slide this way, and he seems slide this way, and it cuts to them dropping into the water. And yeah. Even even I remember when I because I, I I had this VHS when I was like 18, 17, 18 years old, and I I I, I watched it on repeat because I love the damn theme song so much. But that, that cut is mm-hmm. great. It's a great cut. It's a great way to segue from them yeah. doing nasty stuff. Is, I thought, oh, also, one of the greatest lines in all the Bond films, in my opinion, is, oh, I'm sorry, I got you all wet. And he goes, yes, but my martini is still dry. Dry, that yeah. Is bomb. Like that, and it's funny because that doesn't come off as, oh, my God. I don't up. roll my eyes. It's a, great, it's a great line, and he comes off like a pimp. Like, that's a line. You would say to somebody, like, if that's a great line. I, that's, I, that's the bond I'm here for. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's why the movie works because I think that they watched the first three Bond films and said, this is what we're doing. We're doing Dr. No and Goldfinger and From Russia with Love. And we're definitely going for that, you know, Thunderball era. And we're going to make him cool. He's not going to be obnoxious. Well, one of the things I like, I think it's, yeah, it's in Thunderball. It's the same character. He, Sleeps with her in Thunderball. And one of the things I like about it is like shortly after, she even mentions that like, I know you think, you know, you can sleep with girls and turn them. Well, not this one. And I was like, nice. Like, at least you're acknowledging that like your magic dick isn't going to work on me. And this movie goes so much weirder and further with it where She's got him, and she's like, first of all, I'm going to shoot you. You want to know where? I'm going to shoot you in the dick. And then, <laughs> but first, I was the best you ever had, right? He's like, well, there's like, no, you're going to fucking say that I, my pussy was the best. Like, I'm the best. I love that. Right? I, it's, uh, fuck, it's the best. Sure. Here, let me find a piece of trash. Here's a piece of trash. <laughs> right on this piece of trash I found. 
because he says like, oh, I was gonna, I was gonna mention in my memoirs. Well, that's so right. He's like, the, pin, the pin fires the rock. But he yeah. jokes, I was, yes, of course you're the best. I was gonna mention you in my memoir. So she's like, here's memoirs. Here's a piece of trash I found, Mr. Memoir. Great. Right I, I, on the there. Memoirs line is great. The, the memoirs line is great too. I'll, I'll admit the shooting of the pen and the death is gnarly. But I had to go back and rewatch that. I'm like, is she really? Like, she's got him? She's got him with a gun pointing his dick. And she's like, but I was the best lay you ever had, right? Now she's gonna get mad. Like, no, I was the best lay you ever had. Fucking write it down. <laughs> like, and then they find his what they find his body with like a little piece of trash, and it's just like, oh, she was the best I ever had. So then I'm like, well, no, no, maybe I'm reading it wrong. Maybe she's she's messing with him. No, she's not messing with him. No, she just really this really matters to her. Yeah, this she is wants strange. To this is a really strange beat, and I'm not here with it. I'm not jiving with it. But then he shoots her with a thing, and she explodes. It's so amazing. It's she hilarious. explodes. It's great. It's so, boom. I, I thought it was the funniest. Like, that one genuinely makes me laugh. Like, not like the Pierce Brosnan ones. That yeah. made me go, oh, 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 oh. Um, also, I actually, uh, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. Uh, great Felix Leiter. Oh. Great Felix uh, Leiter. No, he was great. Uh, well, he is, Bernie Casey. Bernie Casey from uh, Revenge of the Nerds. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a great Felix. Like, he, they should have, if I was Eon, I, 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 I would have been like, yo, that's the guy. But he's, and, and I think that they also were, because the, the, the newer Felix, other than his, his ethnicity, but how he, how he works his way into the plot of Casino Royale and stuff, I feel like they were influenced by that version of Felix because he's very similar to the Felix that's in the Daniel Craig movies, um, personality-wise. No nonsense. Yeah. My only complaint is that there's not enough of him. Like, I, I feel like Felix has a bigger presence in Thunderball, and he has yes. a less of a presence here. But yes. the guy is so good. So good. I so wish there was more. Him. Yeah, I think he's a dynamite Felix Leiter. Like, they, they, God, that was a mistake. He should have, like, and, and that's another thing is that now what's funny is that MGM owns United Artists, which now, like, with all the sales and the, the changes of things, mm -hmm. um, the company that makes the Bond films and uh, distributes them owns Never Say Never Again. However, it'll never be considered an Eon production because right. W. Broccoli's, a, you know, everybody. Uh, Michael Wilson and, and Barbara Broccoli will, would never include that in their films because they didn't co-sign on it, but of course, right. they'll would be to a kill, um, which is just, that's another conversation. But I think that Never Say Never Again, honestly, I wish, they, I wish they'd been able to change the names of Domino and Largo and everybody because I feel like the movie is different enough from Thunderball that I, I even though there's plot points that are, that are the same, it's stylistically, the actors, everything's so different. I'm like, they've remade plenty of Bond plot lines in other films that this one would yeah. have bothered me. I mean, there's definitely been formulas and beats, but one of the things that holds this movie back for me is I'm just watching, oh God, I mean, I, I even know when I'm watching it's remake of Thunderball, but I keep thinking like, what's, the, I mean, it's aside from like, you know, the my intent to, I have the rights, so therefore I want to make it, therefore because I can make money from the thing that I co-wrote. I have to wonder, like, from an audience standpoint, just like, well, if I'm going to pick one of the two, I'm going to go watch Thunderball. I already saw it. Oh, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. I keep but watching it. And these little things are tweaked here and there, but, you know, um, not enough for me to be like, oh, my God, I loved it. But all things considered, it is a good time. Yeah. That, that theme, though, that theme, as soon as we start talking about it, I said, never never say never uh i that song i can't i love it i i good. i can't get out of my head good tune interesting i mean obviously i, I don't know the specifics but obviously they're not going to open it with the iris the right. shot and the blood and and all that leading into the, the the thing but the movie opens with an action scene mm -hmm. but to oh, that that's song good. they it's don't fit well no well, no i agree with that but the it's action weird is weird and but it that doesn't action. work where he's in the uh, where he's going through the building and he gets yeah. stabbed and everything. I dug I dug that sequence. But, but the I, song is not suited absolutely. I, I watched that whole scene with like a grin on my face because I'm like, this doesn't fit. It was yeah, such a fit. choice that I don't like. Yeah, it doesn't fit. 
but it plays great at the end. Mm -hmm. It's a great oh, yeah. Credits. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, no, oh, and yeah, I love it. It's a good tune, but it's such a weird choice with how to open the movie that way. Open it. They should have played it over the, the end credits because at the end credits, it works perfect. Also, yeah. the Mr. Bean character, I think, is, a, is fun. I like that character. I think he's cool. Um, not in it enough. I mean... Yeah, not in enough. Because I remember Ed seeing him as a kid. Even as a child, I was already into Mr. Bean by, like, age nine. Yeah. And I remember going, hey, Mr. Bean's in this. And then I yeah. expect him to be in it a lot more. He's in it for, like, two scenes. Yeah, two scenes. And it's also... Yeah, it's... um. And I also, I love, uh, I love that he is the voice of, you know, from their perspective, the, of Covey Broccoli and Michael Wilson and all those guys begging Connery to come back for mm -hmm. uh, live, uh, 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 live and Let Die. And he's, he's the joke. And I love it. He goes, no, never again. Yep. And then she goes, never. And he looks at the camera. Dun, dun. Oh, I, I had a laugh at that wink. But, uh, I love it. I love it. Um, another that's thing that's I really... Normal, that's as good as, well, this never happened to the other oh, guy. Yeah. I, 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 great. I love it. Love yeah. it. There's a thin line between eye rolls and success. And they, they both work for me. Right. Absolutely. Um, I agree. And then another thing I liked about Thunderball, I like about this, which is underwater photography, especially when they're in the ship and the sharks get involved. And how many shots of like the stunt swimmer and the shark are in the same shots? It's great stuff. Well, like how, yeah, they. Um, but it's also it's Irving Kirshner, so he yeah. knows what he's doing. But in that in the in those shots, uh, it was funny because once again, as a kid, my mom always talks about Thunderball as being her favorite Bond and how crazy it was with them underwater shooting at each other. And then you you watch um, Never Say Never Again, and it's done differently and done well, also like not the same way. Um, and it's uh, you know, and then once again, even even watching that movie, even though I know I've seen Thunderball, when uh, when Domino kills Largo, it's interesting. Also, yeah, I wasn't a fan of it this time. We weren't a fan of it this time. Yeah, when yeah. I when I watched, I was like, I was like, oh god, that's right, she, it's her. So I I I think I think it was. Uh, it's a tragedy that they had to remake. Uh, I, I think that they were right in the idea that, hey, we could be making better movies with Connery. We just make, we can be making better movies and we could have had Connery back if we were making better movies. Um, and, and uh, but they had to make, you know, they tried to move it away, but they had to make, uh, there was a list done by the, the attorneys that I read that said mm -hmm. all of these elements have to be in the movie in order for it to technically be the movie you you're allowed to make um and so i think it where they made really great choices they're forced to make you know to make really bad decisions um because they have to make that movie and not a new movie right and uh, I, I presume domino killing him is one of them yeah i i from to my knowledge i may be very wrong but I know it, he has to go to. There's also their their reason for him going to the kind of the fat farm thing, is because he's old and he's coming out of retirement, which is different than what's in Thunderbolt. Right. But then that they had to have him in in the the fitness thing. They had to have it be Largo, Domino, uh, Bond, for these setups. The underwater like there's certain beats and characters that could not be changed. Um, I really liked him being at the. Uh at the facility in the beginning for this one because i love that they sent him there with a purpose and i'm like oh yes. well that's yeah. cool well yeah because when they do his like test because now when he finds out like at least he was already on mission but then that guy doesn't get killed there bond just happens to look and see him get like an eye thing and then that information has no bearing on the plot so once again him being there wait what it's, yeah. It was a whole different scenario, but it made me go, huh, again? We did this a second time and we still didn't? Stick it. Yeah. Whatever. Yep. But knowing that Domino kills her, her, her boyfriend slash the villain in, in the first movie. So in this movie, because the first movie, they, they do the underwater thing with the missile, but then they get to the boat. And the whole climax is on the boat. And she's on the boat, so it makes sense. But in this one, she's with Bond. And then right. he's like, I'm going to go save the day. And I'm thinking, oh, our climax is underwater, and it's just Bond? Okay, so I guess Domino's not going to kill him. That's a bummer, because I really like that she did that. And then, for no reason whatsoever, I'm watching this movie, and he gets harpooned. And I look over, and the CIA is there with Domino. Why yep. is she there? Why did the CIA bring a civilian? 
What does she have any reason to be down there for? Other than we need her to kill him. Got it. I get the reason why, but like why in the story is she there? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. But the underwater photography is dope. It's really good. And, and Mr. Bean is great. Mr. Bean is great. And the car yeah, chase I is think, great. I, and it's also it's telling what the audience wanted, but Cubby was like, I'm you know, we we don't negotiate with terrorists. Because the <laughs> because for a movie that comes out the same year, within the same two months, and it grosses, you know, three times its budget, four times its budget, where their movie you know, the Octopussy costs a lot more and only doubled its budget. Um, it, it was very telling that they, if they had the rights to Bond, they probably could have continued it and done very, very well. Um, and, but, but, you know... Uh, Octopussy didn't make more. It may have... You know, Octopussy, Octopussy made 20 million more. However, right. it cost like 100 exactly. million. Exactly. But like when it comes to just like the grosses, Octopussy was more successful in the U.S., and it was more successful right. worldwide. Right, but if despite you... Despite the budget differences. Yeah. If yeah. you adjust them for budget, it's kind of like the Kevin Smith... It's Kevin Smith or Sylvester Stallone argument. Kevin Smith and Sylvester Stallone always say, you know, we make our movies for nothing. And when our movie grosses $70 million and our movie costs $1 million, we netted a, a bigger profit. However, right. when a movie it costs $100 million and they make $150 million off it, they technically made more money but they spent more money to do it, so the so the the profit is smaller, mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of what this scenario was. Where if you if you look at uh, Never Say Never Again, it was more oh. profitable from the standpoint that they spent very little money. For it. Yeah, I get it. I just know that like in the public's eye, when it comes to like box office, yeah. and that's oh, yeah. in that oh, year yeah. of like Bond versus Bond, they're like, wow, people still prefer. Uh, Timothy Dalton. Yeah, but I think I think in modern day, it's a different conversation when people look at it because people. You know, people look at that and they go, wait a minute. Because also, I was looking at the grosses, and from Dr. No to Thunderbolt, the gross doubled every movie. Mm -hmm. But I know it the was, budget from, from Russia with Love to Dr. No was already a big jump. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, for, the, for the profit, the, the, like the first movie made like 19 to $20 million total. But then the second one made like 45 And then the third one made like 80 so it was like it was like crazy jumps and then all of a sudden it comes to um uh, uh you only live twice and it dips a little bit on our medicine secret service dipped a lot and then uh uh diamonds are forever it came back up even though people didn't like the movie but then um live and let die was more in line with honor Majesty's secret service and then once you get to octopussy uh, they're in, you know, they're closer to the Connery range, but the movies are costing a hell of a lot more. And then for Never Say Never Again to be in competition with that, based on a movie everyone's already seen, um, mm -hmm. and arguably the fans that are going to go see a Connery movie have seen, you know, Thunderball tons of times. Also, we didn't talk about Thunderball's song. Great song. Oh, awesome. Yo. And, -da -da -da. and the way that, one of my favorite things about Bond movies, and I, I didn't, you know, become aware of it because uh, my first Bond movie in a theater was Goldeneye, 95. And that was like my, I, I didn't, I, I vaguely was aware of them watching some on TV with my dad, but I wasn't like into them. Goldeneye got me into them. And one of the things I noticed about those movies is that there's a song, but they integrate the song into the score that becomes the theme of the movie. And that's what's so fun is seeing how far back, because the use of the Thunderball melody in the score for Thunderball is awesome. Ba -na -na -na. So good. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, it's great. I think they integrate Goldfinger too. Yes. Goldfinger, yeah. 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 And even even um you own the twice, the -na 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 -na. that that mm -hmm. that shows up in the score as well. Yeah. No, the score, yeah. The score and never say never again sucks. <laughs> it sucks. Well, it's just not there. You don't even know what well, it is. Yeah, it's it was the fight with I don't remember because they're they're in the French I forget where they are <laughs> where the boats are the French Riviera I think it's the Riviera yeah. but then they just go a little bit and they go to this island with a bunch of I guarantee the movie doesn't even know what country they're like people in turbans yes they're brown they have beards and they have turbans you know 
Um, but that whole chase scene with him and the horse rescuing. Oh yeah, that's Donald. so weird. That's 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 well, kind but of the, a weird. But the music is the strangest, like upbeat, yeah. silly ditty. And that this was the first time. It took about an hour and a half for me to think. I missed the Bond theme. I hadn't really yeah. noticed until yeah. you played this silly thing. Didn't they, the don't they jump off a cliff on a horse or something? Like, or jump out of a castle or something? With a horse? Yeah, he jumps off the edge of a castle with a horse. <laughs> I was thinking yeah. there was going to be something down there to catch him. I'm like, oh, no, it's just water. They're just going to, all right. At least the horse is fine. But yeah, and speaking of music, there's one, one little thing that really threw me off of Never Say Never Again. He gets to the casino. Mm -hmm. And then he enters in the casino, and it's silent. Yeah, which is there, weird. There's no band playing, and there's no score, and all you hear is the extra sound effects of like, and it felt like when you see a like an early cut of a movie, and we haven't put in the score yet, or mm -hmm. like the. It even reminded me of like the the trailer that leaked for the Mummy with Tom Cruise, where you just hear like, Whoa. oh yeah. Because that's all you hear is yeah. and then the camera will pass by people in the, the foreground and they don't loop their lines. And I'm like, was there music in this that like they didn't have the home video rights to? Because you see that a lot with TV shows when they yeah. the earlier deals before DVD, where they license the song for these shows, but they don't have the home video rights for them. So they either just omit them or replace them. And I'm like, is there a song here? Because right. this is, and it goes on for minutes, and it's strange. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Yeah, it's something and then, else. And, then it, and it carries on when they go to the arcade, because, you know, yeah, classy Barbie. arcades, those video oh, games are all the rage right now. <laughs> yeah. And then they go to, like, this dance scene where there is a band playing, and it, I, I don't know, it, it was really jarring, only because it was so blatantly, I'm missing something, and here's just the hubbub of random extras, which also aren't, the room has... 100, 200 people in it. And right. you hear the murmur of maybe 20 people. Something is strange, too. That is, would have been blanketed uh, if there was music playing. I wouldn't have noticed that you only have 20 people murmuring. Right. There's something strange music wise um, that's not, it's just a taste thing. It's very, and I know they were trying to make, make it very hip and, and updated. Um, it's strange when she's in the dance room on the boat and she's listening to this really horrible stock jazzy pop music 80s pop music it just is so weird to see sean and connery walk into the dance uh studio with that playing it's a very because him as bond you know 60s partial 70s then for him to in 1983 right show up in your 80s pop music playing it's very i weird. still think more and then dalton when it comes to 80s and that music yeah because well, so, even, so, there, even so much there. of it but his, there's nothing very 80s about his hair or the way the movie's shot or anything. It just, it, it, but the ridiculous video game sequence and that song being used and her like 80s jazzercise outfit. Yeah, and the weird um, song outfit, yeah. Yeah. Because uh, it, it felt like we're trying to appeal to the audience that remembers Connery and not right. skewing to kids. But it felt like they had to try something. They're like, well, these kids yeah. sure like video games. What if Bond played like a video game with stakes and it that seen as a slog to get through? That is, it, it, it's very slow too. Because also, and also, it almost points out that Bond is too old to know what the hell he's doing, <laughs> but he's going against a middle aged bald guy already. So it's it's very, it's kind of weird. Very oh, strange. it's so random that they're like, uh, not complaining, but if we're, if we're remaking Thunderball, we still have to have Blofeld in this. So Max von Sydow. But we're not really, we're not really gonna. Like, was it? I, my only thought was like they now had to legally have Blofeld in it. Yeah, but, I guess. I mean, I and, and Max von Sydow, I, I would have, dude, I would have rewritten that. So Max von Sydow, he's gonna yeah. be in this movie. We're gonna, he's gonna kill Largo in the in the second act. And he's gonna show up, and that's who's gonna get shot underwater. And, you know. That would have been cool. And again, I like I like the new Largo. I thought he had. Presence. He's, he's creepy. I like he, him. He's he's he smug. Yeah, and and I I believe he's the bad guy. Yeah. He's good. He's really good. Yeah. I'll be honest. I don't know who he is, but he was great. He's great in that movie. Yeah, I don't know who that actor is, but I really dug him. Army. He's good. He's really good. He's really yeah, good. 
But I mean, I, I do think that this, this, it's, it's a tragic thing. And, and this happens, you know, regularly in, in sadly in, uh, in films that are, you know, franchise films is that what starts off great and improves only becomes worse with time and sequels, you know, and it's, uh, it's too bad because I love sequels. I'm a sequels guy. Movies with sequels typically will attract me more but they need to be well written and tonally need to understand what works in the movies that came before, as opposed to let's pick the things that we think work because we're producers and we're not in touch with reality. And then we make these movies where we, we overdo the parts that people actually didn't like and these movies become silly and bad. Yeah. Uh, there's a part of me that I didn't, I didn't, there was something about the Bond movies when I was a kid that felt mature. And now at this age, I actually never felt this way, even in my 20s, where this era feels juvenile. Mm -hmm. And not in an insulting way, because there's something enjoyable about that sort of thing. But like him putting on the rocket pack, I'm sure it was really exciting in the 60s for Thunderball, but now I just think like, oh, like, I don't, I don't mean that it's cheesy. I just feel like it's meant to excite you, even as an adult, because that was like a new thing. But to be like, ooh, that's cool. The way kids go, ooh. And I see that a lot in these 60s movies. It's just- Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's, it almost feels like they were meant for children if it weren't for some of the heavier adult content i right. don't even notice it as so much of a like a like an adult male fantasy because that's still there traveling the world but like the gadgetry and and just some of the attitude is that way like a kid wishes he could talk to his teacher his disregard for the, his boss and work yeah. at the, work, came to work at mcdonald's my boss and i just wish i could be like on the counter and be like and I'm like oh you um yeah i, I it's not, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I, I just never realized how much of this appeals. It's, I think it totally appeals to a younger. Yeah. Vibe. and I, I Maybe not the younger audience, but there is definitely a vibe to it. Yeah. It's interesting. And Lord knows it's there in the freaking Roger Moore movies. And oh yeah. The transforms and, and, you know, and we'll, we'll get there. But I think, I think that um, going back as an adult and being Bond's age at this point, because you and I are in, the range of Bond's age range he's supposed to be in in these movies. Uh, Bond's a douchebag, and he's he, you know, and, and I don't and I don't think that the Connery movies are as good as we remember, or his his version of Bond is as good as we remember. Um, and and I'm much more attracted to other versions of Bond. Um, but you know, the first four are solid movies. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we're really kind of just pandering to our need to see Sean Connery be that, and he never was again. But even in his last two, he still delivers. And I feel like that's worth noting, that even when the movies can sometimes fail the story, like, I was genuinely surprised in uh, uh, You Only Live Twice as the movie is unfolding. And I'm like, this is sillier than some of the other ones. Interesting. And as it's progressively getting sillier, he actually is less jokey and mm -hmm. less smarmy and a little more focused and lethal and like calm in the sillier movie. Like he's actually kind of better in yeah, that he, movie. Yeah, in, in the silly movie. In that third act of You Only Live Twice, he's the straight man easily. And he's the one kind of getting us through it. Um, even, you know, when you have some of the craziest shit going down in that movie, especially in the last, in the third act. But he's, he's Sean Connery. And, and I think that that's something that he pushed for. And I think that Diamonds Are Forever, he does play it pretty serious, but he showed up, he showed up to play it. I think that was him going, yeah, I should have, I shouldn't have come back. And I think that's also when um, Cubby and all of them were like, we were right. We need to go a different route. Unfortunately, they continued the silliness. And, um, and I think that he did never say never again to apologize for Diamonds Are Forever. And then that I mean, was it. And there's no denying, even if I can say that it, it hasn't aged the way I, I hoped it would, there is an undeniable 
charisma and charm to what he's doing. Even if yeah. I don't necessarily like the scene itself for Bond, if it's just him like talking to a girl and then like, you know, business is calling. He's like, "Oh, hey," but I'd still like to. Like, I get the little wink, the little snuggle, the little vibe. Uh, I, the only difference now is, even though he's playing it well, the difference now is that maybe it's because I take Bond more seriously than these producers did. When right. M's like, "We need you to come in the office," and like now because there's a bomb or something, and he's like, "All right, I'll be there in thirty. I'll be there in an hour." Like, no. Don't fuck that girl. Go save the world. You're like, and the, and mm, like, I would be furious if, you know, Southern tip of France exploded because Bond wanted to wait a half an hour to knock one out. I, I totally get it. But, but it's, totally more, it. it's more of a fantasy. It's more like the fantasy comes first and then the logistics of his job comes second and later. We but it also it often works. It works in certain films and certain situations, and it doesn't in others. Because there's a great one at the beginning of uh, uh, *Living Daylights*, but it's not "Yo, Bond, get here. People are dying." It's much more of like a "I'll be there. I'll, I'll, I'll make it. I'll be there in an hour." Better make it two. Like it, you know, and we'll get there. But yeah, they, they yeah, some of that effect fun. happens with with Connery too. But yeah, uh, yeah, it is what it is. But yeah. he's, st he's still good. He's still great. He's great. He's definitely better than others. Um, but he's just, as, as, as I age, he becomes not better than some others and better than others. And it's, you, I, know, you know. I genuinely did not see that happening when I hit you up a few weeks ago. I'm like, hey, do you want to talk about Bond? Let's, let's I didn't just, see that. Let's just talk Connery. I didn't I, see that before you started watching Goldfinger. And I was like, yeah. Had no had no intent. Yeah. Yeah. Let's still get to, I mean, yeah. All right. I feel like it's been probably like two and a half hours. No, yeah. it's been like it's been a little. It's been about two and a half hours. We did, so, we did cover uh, like seven films, so I mean, you know. Yeah. Uh, but you and I will get together and do a much shorter video for the one Lazenby movie. But I think Next. I think there's gonna be a lot more to talk about in that, to be honest, because there are in one film, so much there, are, good. there are more jewels oh. than all of the uh, Roger Moore and all so of the Frozen films. Yeah. So I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation because yeah. we, you know there's going to be it's going to be a love fest. But I, I think that we're going to get to talk about stuff that really uh, deserved it was it was much more um, influential on later Bond films, mm -hmm. um, including the most recent um, that people discounted and didn't you know didn't care about this movie for 20 30 years and now in modern day it's it's easily one of the best ones so yeah uh so if you're still watching come back for that at some point um we'll talk about lazenby next but thanks for joining me man it's been fun i love talking nerdy crap with you as always as we have for the last 20 years yeah and uh yeah man i i can't wait to dive into uh uh, Lazenby and um, Moore and yeah. Dalton and Brosnan because there's lots of opinions you know because now we're now we're getting to the land where they're reusing stuff and it's it's a formula mm -hmm. and that's that's kind of interesting now that we've, we've gotten through these you know and then getting to Daniel Craig and you know how we got there and why that's interesting so can't yeah. wait I'm dreading the, the I mean I had to write some notes eventually because to me uh, I, I can I know it sounded like I was wrapping up and now I'm talking again uh, Daniel Craig's done four. He's going to be doing the fifth. Brosnan's done four. I can remember four, four, and two. Right. You start doing more than four, my brain starts to be like, which one was the one that... Let me fucking write down which one was... This is the one where Q showed up. Got it. Yeah. And more did like seven. Yeah. Yeah. So... And also, they're all the worst. So... <laughs> That's yeah. not true. I, I still maintain Dine Other Day is the worst, and then all the more ones. But uh, yeah. Oh well. Okay. We may we may have a little bit of a hype. Dine Another Day is pretty bad, but so is View to a Kill. So we'll we'll get there. We, yeah, but Dine Another Day, and then View to a Kill, and then I think you've got them like that. But I got them like this. Yeah, I think I think I yeah. I hate Dine Another Day. I really do too. More than View to a Kill. I'm gonna have to watch View to a Kill again to to. View to a Kill is a dope song. No. 
the only thing I like about that movie is that song. It's so great. No, that's what I mean. It's got a dope song. Oh, it's got an incredible song. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I was. Yeah. No, that's the you best know, thing about it. That, I'm like, ooh, I love that song. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. The best thing has going for actually both those movies. Oh, the I, like, of the day. I like Madonna's Dino of the Day. Oh, it's yeah. great. Oh yeah. I think that that was that was a little bit of a comeback moment for her. That was a great song. I remember um, we were working together at that point. Uh, and I and when that song came on the radio, I was like, "Oh my God! Have you mm. heard the new Bond song? It's so good!" And then the movie was just something the else. worst. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining me. It's been a nice, fun distraction. Um, until next time, man.